Security. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Um, good morning everyone and welcome to the, the 14th meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, obviously, due to ongoing safeguarding measures still in place in regards to COVID-19, some members will be in attendance this morning via teleconference and our witnesses will also be briefing the committee via teleconference. Um, the meeting will be broadcast live and the recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the Assembly website. Um, members can mute their tablets using the F4 buttons, please. Um, okay, so moving on then to item number one on the agenda, we have apologies from Stuart Dixon. There aren't any other apologies. Nope, no, everybody's here. either here or on the phone. Great, thank you. Um, item number two then is our draft minutes. Um, they are on page five of members' pack. Are members content that the minutes are an accurate reflection of the meeting? Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, item three then is chairperson's business, and there's a, a few items here. Um, in your table pack at pages 3 and um, 15, there is the executive recovery plan and summary document. Um, these were obviously just published yesterday and have been circulated by the clerk by email. Um, do members have agree to note or do they wish to suggest any actions in relation to these? <laughs> Happy to note for now. Noted, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, the clerk also yesterday circulated an update from the department in regards to the insolvency LCM. The LCM will now include mutuals. Um, the minister will also seek to include credit unions and co-ops going forward. So um, members will be aware that there's a short window to scrutinise the bill in the LCM. The bill is expected to be introduced at Westminster on the 19th of May and the LCM um, laid at the Assembly on the 20th of May with the debate on that on the 26th of May. So our members agreed um, for the committee office to seek stakeholder views immediately with a view to bring in a report to members as quickly as possible. Great. Teacher. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, so our first uh, briefing this morning via teleconference is um, Enterprise NI and um, Intertrade NI or Intertrade Ireland um, on the update on the impact of COVID-19. Um, there is a clerk's memo at page 13, a briefing note from um, Enterprise NI at page 15, and a, a briefing from Entertrade Ireland at page 20. Um, the Enterprise NI written brief and associate papers from page 23 in your table packs, including a 10 point plan for recovery, headline findings from Enterprise NI COVID impact. COVID-19 impact survey in April and barometer findings from November 2019. Um, members will also have received a briefing um, from Intertrade Ireland uh, last night. Um, it was received after the table pack had been issued, so members would have received it by email um, by the clerk. The, the briefing was awaiting the minister's clearance. Um, so I'd just like to welcome to the meeting this morning um, Michael McQuillan, who's Chief Executive of Enterprise NI and Aidan Gough, who is the Designated Accounting Officer and Director of Strategy and Policy of Endertrade Ireland. Um, can you both hear us okay? Yes, good morning, Sir Michael here, can hear you. Good morning. Um, are you okay then to make an opening statement and we'll open up to members to ask questions after that? Uh, yes, we are. Will we go in, in, in sequence, Sir? If I maybe start, Michael here, Enterprise NI. Yep, that's grand, thank you. Okay, well, uh, good morning, uh, Chair and members. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to, to present uh, to the Economy Committee and for your consideration as we've outlined our, our recent surveys and the 10 point plan for recovery uh, that we've developed and, and, and submitted. As it has been some time since Enterprise Northern Ireland has uh, actually been in front of the committee, and maybe just uh, use the opportunity for, from an informational perspective to update members. Enterprise Northern Ireland represents the 28 local enterprise agencies across Northern Ireland, providing tenancy with wraparound support to more than 1,900 micro and small businesses, uh, actively engaged in the delivery and practical support of pre-start startups and establishing businesses, uh, and managing responsibly uh, the Northern Ireland Small Business Loan Fund and, and Startup Loan Fund. In any average week, in normal time, pre-COVID, the network will engage directly with more than 3,000 businesses. Enterprise Northern Ireland, we're a self-funding, uh, not-for-profit small business, essentially. 
and the 28 local enterprise agencies are predominantly set up as small uh, registered charities. Now, despite in recent weeks uh, being under operational pressure and, and being put under pressure for business continuity as a result of COVID, the network has continued to be actively connected and engaged with businesses throughout every local community uh, across the north. We've engaged directly with more than 6,000 businesses in recent weeks. And during the first few weeks, the focus was on uh, survival support and guidance, including, but not exhaustive, survival, cash flow, and liquidity management, navigation and help around the announced support measures, and then highlighting and lobbying uh, on behalf of those businesses that have fallen between the cracks of the early uh, support scheme. We did carry out a, a comprehensive survey about two weeks ago uh, towards the end of April and a uh, very good response across all sectors uh, and from right across Northern Ireland. Uh, the findings reflected at that point in time a real view of how the 130 odd thousand micro and small and self-employed businesses are coping with the impact of COVID-19 and indeed reflected on how they were engaging with the schemes. Uh, that were or weren't accessible and that were or weren't uh, supportive. Uh, a quick snippet, about 48% of the micro, small and self-employed businesses that responded at that point in time felt that uh, they, if the COVID-19 crisis continued for as long as three more months, that they would not survive uh, further than 12 months into the future. In recent weeks, whilst the survival support and highlighting businesses that have fallen between the cracks is still prevalent, our emphasis has now moved from emergency response through survival and now to what we're calling reboots and, and recovery planning. Recovery planning must be fluid and it must be agile just because there's a lack of certainty around timing, how businesses can reopen, how many businesses won't reopen, uh, how and when domestic and international markets will reopen, Will what are now in many cases fractured supply chains mend quickly? What government support measures will be in place during reboot uh, and, and recovery? And we can't forget, although it has been moved from the headlines, uh, that our business population were already dealing with the uncertainty of uh, Brexit timelines. The 10 point plan for recovery that we have, we have submitted has been informed by the ongoing engagement uh, across the local enterprise network with thousands of businesses uh, 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 on, a, on, a, on a weekly basis and from the, lo the, the, the very recent uh, survey. I'm not going to go through all 10 points, but we'd like to highlight briefly point five, the need going forward for a regional-wide coordinated program of recovery and rebuild support. We've done some extensive work around the design of, of content and, and delivery uh, in this and the need for flexibility. Point seven, uh, continued and enhanced liquidity measures are going to be required uh, that can be affected by the Northern Ireland Assembly and indeed UK, UK Gov, including extended rates relief uh, and further deferment on, on, on uh, payments such as, as, as VAT. Point eight, a coordinated programme of support for unemployed and economically inactive. Uh, a fact is that in the next coming months, our, our unemployment rates in Northern Ireland are going to, to increase substantially, and the number of businesses that don't reopen are going to increase uh, substantially. Uh, so we need a comprehensive programme that will look at pathways back to self-employment uh, and pathways back to startup. I emphasise the need for a significant startup stimulus uh, programme. And across the, 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 the programmes of support during recovery, we need to be cognizant of the mental health, resilience and well-being of employees and indeed the owners of small and micro businesses, being for the majority of my working life uh, in, on the other side, not in business support, but in, in, in running businesses uh, through the, the, our troubled past. Uh, through the last financial crisis, uh, I, I know and I've, I've, I've cried with a few businesses in the last number of weeks uh, because I feel their pain. I know what they're, what they're going through. Um, we need to blend that support for resilience and mental health into our, our recovery uh, planning. Uh, and point 10 uh, is that uh, we, we have asked, uh, because of our uh, action-focused approach and the fact that we're at the interface on a weekly basis uh, with hundreds of businesses, that there should be ENI Enterprise Northern Ireland involvement in a in a task recovery force that should be set up uh, on a time bound uh, uh, target uh, basis. 
the finally the, the emergency support measures announced so far are welcomed by the thousands of businesses that we have been working with directly. They're proving to be a lifeline for many. There are still significant gaps and on a daily basis we're supporting hundreds of businesses to try and get that lifeline support. Yesterday's approach to decision making around relaxing the lockdown announced by the First Minister and Deputy First Minister is also welcome. From a business planning perspective, timelines with conditional triggers would have been better, and that's from a, from a business perspective. Uh, businesses like plans, businesses like targets, businesses like timelines. Uh, in their absence, however, in, the, in, the, in what we uh, have heard yesterday, and, and as we wait for more detail, the daily updates promise the potential flexibility on timelines uh, promise and the promise of good notice being given and pro are provided for a movement to the next stage will be helpful for, 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 for businesses. The micro and small and self-employed businesses that we're engaging today really need sensitive tapering of the emergency support schemes uh, as we transition into recovery. The, the announced uh, extension and uh, tapering of furloughing uh, is, is welcome. The details we're still we're still waiting, waiting on. The hardship fund uh, is, is, is announcement is, is welcome. The details of of eligibility criteria and, and timelines uh, imminent. Uh, we hope uh, we need a, a, a additional timely support and incentives such as the programmes I briefly outlined uh, as we head forward and a reinforced emphasis. On enterprise uh, and startup. Uh, thanks, committee. The social and economic consequences of thousands of micro and small businesses closing is unthinkable uh, and must be avoided. So, thank you very much. Okay. Good morning, Good morning Chair. Uh, unfortunately, I have quite a bad line, but I can just about hear you. So, um, do you want me to um, begin with some opening remarks? Okay, um, well, like Michael, I mean, this is our first time in front of the committee since the restoration of the Vaughan government, and so I'd like to take a, a few minutes just to provide a, an update on cross-border trade and business development, the performance of Intertrade Ireland over the past number of years, before turning, obviously, to the impact of COVID-19 and our response. First then, in terms of cross-border trade, it has been performing very strongly recovering uh, quite dramatically from the shock of the 07, 08, 09 financial collapse. And in 2018, it stood at over £6.5 billion, which was an increase of 6% in the previous year. Service trade in particular has been growing very strongly, growing at nearly 11% compared to 4.5% growth in goods trade. Now, while the value of trade has grown substantially over the last number of years, we have also seen the intricacies of the market really developing. Our 2018 cross-border trade and supply chain linkages report showed that um, Northern Ireland, or that almost 80% of cross-border trade is in intermediate products. That, it is, that means that it's through highly connected, what are now all island supply chains. We also know from our research that cross-border trade is particularly important for small businesses. Indeed, um, for, for Northern Ireland, uh, for Ireland is the only export market for nearly 80% of Northern Ireland's micro firms and for 70% of its small firms. Small firms indeed account for 93% of all the exports from Northern Ireland to Ireland. So Intertrade Ireland has contributed to this growth in cross-border trade through its own comprehensive package of supports. Last year we celebrated our 20th anniversary. And over that time, we, uh, Intertrade Ireland, has engaged with over 42,000 businesses. We've directly supported 9,000 businesses through our range of programmes. And this support has generated £1.1 billion uh, pounds in business development value. Um, it has created oh, oh, close to 16,000 jobs. And these are jobs in small businesses that are, in, are located in every county uh, in Northern Ireland and in Ireland. Um, now, um, I suppose we, um, of course, in the, in the 2016, 
we had the uh, results of the Brexit, re uh, Brexit referendum, and that, of course, um, given our, uh, our remit to develop cross-border trade and business development, obviously it changed the focus of the body to some degree. But um, we do run, uh, before getting to Brexit, I want, just want to run over a number of our programmes. Uh, our, our, we deliver programmes through two th key pillars, uh, that is um, innovation and trade and business development, uh, our seals. So in, the, in, the, in trade, we have the Acumen programme, and it's pr proven very successful in assisting small businesses developing their new markets, new customers, and new sustainable uh, sources of income. The Elevate program is another trade program that offers funding for specialist sales and marketing support to grow micro enterprises. Essentially, these programs help businesses develop export capability. And what we find is that 75% of businesses that develop that export capability go on to export off the island. We also offer supports to help businesses access the public procurement markets in Northern Ireland, in Ireland. The other pillar, as I say, is innovation. It is a number of support programs in place uh, for, to promote business innovation, which leads to growth. We know that tr businesses that export and businesses that innovate are three times more likely to be growing. We have a fusion program, which helps to fund high caliber science, engineering, technology graduates and partners. It partners businesses with third level institutions on a cross-border basis. The average return for a participant on a fusion program is 750,000. Um, another example of an innovation program is the challenge program, which embeds proven, reliable, repeatable, and new innovation models into, any, into a small business. We also operate a funding for growth program, which supports innovative businesses' access to access finance that will allow them to grow. Um, as well as that, we support a number of uh, and provide secretariat support, working in partnership with other agencies to um, support initiatives like the US Ireland R&D Partnership and the All Island Horizon 2020 Steering Committee, which helps <coughs> Um, businesses and um, research institutions from Northern Ireland and Ireland to access international funding streams. Now, I, I mentioned Brexit there, and just to come, up, <coughs> come back to Brexit, uh, this was the, the first unplanned and dramatic external shock to the system over the last few years. Um, following the referendum, we very, were very quick, we very quickly initiated research on the impact of the various outcomes <coughs> for the businesses that we would be supporting. Well, we didn't know then, we still don't know what an agreement will look like. It was very quickly apparent from our research that a no-deal scenario posed a real threat to cross-border trade, and that small businesses in particular were most exposed. Even more um, worrying, I suppose, was the understanding of business preparedness for any disruption to the, 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 the model of trade that then pertains. So our all, all, <coughs> excuse me, our all Island biz Quarterly Business Monitor showed in September 2016 that 98% of businesses across the island had no plans in place to deal with uh, uh, the UK exit from, from, from the European Union. Uh, on that basis, we developed uh, a various support and these were rolled out by Intertrade Ireland. We launched a Brexit advisory service for potential and cross-border traders in early 2017, and that provided service, uh, including direct access to technical advice in areas such as tariffs, non-tariff barriers, rules of origin, certification, staffing, exchange management, logistics, all stuff that we found that small businesses in particular uh, had little experience or capability to deal with. We also uh, provided a Brexit readiness vouchers to the value of £2,000 to help businesses gain this experience. Um, the uptake of our Brexit planning vouchers and our support services were, were ha has been high, and we f fully expect this to rise again at the end of the year, uh, as the end of the year approaches and details of um, of a deal or a no deal um, begin to emerge. Now, of course, we're dealing with um, a second 
is very unexpected and um, in many cases catastrophic, catastrophic shock to the system. Our first priority in this has been to help the businesses. Um, first of all, our first priority was our staff and ensuring staff safety and that the body was up uh, and, and operational. And that has been successful and we are, we are while it's the second best option, we are to continuing to deliver our services remotely. Uh, but um, our first priority in terms of the businesses we serve was to help the small border create, uh, traders that were currently on our support programs to get this through to get through this pandemic, and that, in that regard, almost all existing projects have uh, are continuing. Uh, we are also continuing to deliver our own services, and we've just launched a comprehensive support package for cross-border traders that it includes um, an eMERGE program that helps businesses develop online sales and e-commerce solutions. We have an emergency business solutions program that offers professional advice for cross-border uh, traders. We also launched the COVID-19 innovation response maps, a response map that maps um, technology partnerships that have developed among the business community in response to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. There's also a series of funding and recovery webinars focused on COVID-19 supports, things like cash flow management and funding, um, government supports and how to access them, and planning for recovery. And uh, there's also some exciting webinars and issues that will be critical for small businesses um, in, in developing a strategic response to, Christ, to, uh, to crises like this. So we have international experts that will be taking these, and that begins on the 19th of May when Dr. Lisa Messini of Queens will be talking about strategic tools for SME crisis management. Furthermore, uh, through our co-innovate uh, EU funded program, in which we are the lead partner, that, that pro program has um, responded and repurposed uh, some of its um, offerings and brought together a cross-border group of up to 20 small, medium, large enterprises with academic support. And these, are, these enterprises are working together, repurposing their facilities and supply chains, and are beginning to mass produce urgently needed PPE for healthcare systems. So, we continue to deal flexibly with our businesses uh, on all our programs, and we continue to, we will continue to work very flexibly with the businesses that uh, that are continuing to look for support from Intertrade Ireland. And in that regard, we have been surprised that the pipeline for um, of some of our main programs, like Acumen Fusion that I mentioned earlier, has uh, remained relatively strong. So um, just, just to finish, I suppose, uh, uh, just for a comprehensive overview, we have also been looking, and to finish maybe on a more positive note, we have been, prior to the COVID-19, working on the development with our board of a new corporate plan. And this does, this was highlighting many areas of, of opportunity for cross-border trade uh, and business development. And these areas include things like um, cooperation on um, Industry 4.0 and the opportunities that it, that it offers, the new technologies that are coming down the tracks and that are going to change the way many businesses work, adaptation to a low carbon economy, and uh, also the redevelopment or the development of cross-border clusters. We would be targeting SME productivity, which is a key challenge for both governments on the island. And uh, we know from our own research that uh, cross-border traders uh, have a higher level of productivity than businesses that don't uh, get involved in cross-border trade. Um, in terms of sectors, we see real opportunity in areas like the bioeconomy, uh, advanced manufacturing, and life sciences. Um, so, uh, Chair, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. I'll leave plenty of time for discussion and questions. Um, those overviews are very useful. Um, so the things I suppose the committee are, are very um, interested in at the minute is the, the kind of su practical supports that are, are needed um, for businesses 
now and as, as we begin to plan for, for reopening and recovery. And so all of the suggestions that have been made around those, we will be feeding into the department. Um, the gaps in the schemes as well, um, we have been doing some work around that and we will be continuing to do that. Um, you mentioned the hardship specifically, uh, or the hardship fund specifically, and, I, and we are hoping um, that that's going to be announced this week. Um, obviously, some businesses have been expressing frustration about um, the gaps that are there, and, and so we have been trying to, to reflect that through as well. Um, we are very aware of businesses having ongoing commitments, and you've mentioned several there around utilities and um, insurance payments and things like that contained within in the, the briefing document there. Um, and I guess I would have a question around um, insurance payments, for, for example, um, I guess the feedback that the committee has been getting is um, businesses haven't, for example, received any insurance payouts. There has been a difficulty with that. Uh, that would be one question. Are you aware of any businesses that have been able to access insurance payouts um, in respect of business interruption? Um, and then um, secondly, I suppose I would just ask about um, the the importance, I suppose, there of the cross-border trade um, and the development of um, all Ireland supply chains, given the, the interruption of global supply chains, will be important um, in terms of, of recovery, if you have any thoughts around that. And then just uh, to pick up on the, the Brexit um, issues, obviously, um, in terms of preparation for businesses, we, we know what the protocol requires. Um, the extent of what will be required is, I suppose, a bit dependent on the, the outcome of the negotiations. But um, what preparations are being put in place now for um, businesses uh, in terms of the support that you are providing to prepare for whatever the outcomes will be of that? And that, that's all from me from now. Okay. Uh, Michael, can you take the insurance one and I take the, the cross border? Yeah, well, and well, indeed, well, indeed. Well, in relation to, 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 to the insurance, well, the insurance sector is one of the sectors that, that um, uh, from the business's point of view, uh, haven't been playing ball, and it's been very, very difficult. That said, if you put yourself in the shoes in, in, in the insurance industry, it's, it's very uncertain cases that they're dealing with, and, and uh, one payout in insurance could open the floodgates and could cause a, a, a dramatic, a dramatic shock there. So I have a degree of understanding of where the insurance companies are coming from. We, we have been working across the local enterprise agency network with uh, numerous companies and businesses, as I've said. Many of those uh, have been trying to, to, to look at their insurance, look at the detail, uh, and claim for some COVID-19 uh, insurance uh, relief. It hasn't come to the fore uh, as yet. Widening a, a little in the, in the insurance sector is, is, is an issue that, that has emerged around credit insurance, for, uh, which, which is something that, uh, again, uh, is really, really important uh, for those uh, businesses. Uh, a lot of the businesses here uh, will design uh, their products here, get them manufactured uh, elsewhere, uh, and have to, to put insurance in place for big, big payments uh, of, for stock in advance of, of, of getting them. Uh, and there's problems there as well, again, just caused by the, the, the global uncertainty. And insurance companies aren't being clear uh, as to how they're going, because that will be necessary in the reboot and reco recovery stage. So the, the, the news charts, it's still not good from, from an, 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 an insurance uh, uh, perspective. And all the more reason why you mentioned the hardship fund there again, uh, that, that uh, you know, those businesses that have, that have fallen between the gaps, we reckon there'd be about 8,000 businesses maybe eligible uh, for the hardship grant, although we are waiting on details uh, of, of the, the uh, criteria. And, and uh, you know, if that is the case, that, that should be, and we must bear this in mind, that should be about a third then of, of all businesses in Northern Ireland will have been able to access uh, support. Uh, now, we are still fighting for those who, who, um, who have been noticed of being able to access the support but, but, but can't. But that's a significant number, but it means that two-thirds of businesses haven't. That doesn't mean to say that two-thirds of the businesses are in severe trouble. There's, a, 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 there's three types of businesses. One uh, is the type of business that is continuing to trade and doing quite well. The other type of business at the moment is the business that, that's gone into hibernation and, and mothball, and, and uh, support has helped create that uh, in the eye of the storm stability. 
And then the third type of business is unfortunately the business that's in, in, in severe trouble uh, and that might not get through. Thank you for that. In terms of the, the, the cross-border issues that you raised, Chair, um, I do think it's going to be, uh, and this COVID crisis and the Brexit um, and the Brexit decision have really shown the importance of cross-border supply chains to the economies of Northern Ireland and indeed to Ireland, and it will be important to uh, strengthen what are what we identify as very strategically important ones, particularly in the food sector, but also in the the wider research and health sectors. And um, Intertrade Ireland is is currently working on a number of. Um, research and development clusters and, and partnerships um, and there is a real willingness um, now to um, to co to cooperate on um, on on initiatives that deliver value to all participants um, in terms of brexit and what's happening our focus at the minute and over the next few months will be to try and provide clarity to to the small businesses that we that we support uh, on the details that emerge and the implications of, of the of, a, of the details and the agreements that will be um, hopefully emerging from from the negotiations. In terms of you mentioned specifically cross border supply chains, we have um, one concern at the minute, um, and we are doing some work on this, uh, and it's in regard to the amount of um, Cross of, of Northern Ireland exports into um, into into Ireland that are then that are going into supply chains and that are um, part of a, a good that is then exported to a, a country that is um, outside the EU, but with what the EU has a free trade agreement with, and um, how will Northern Ireland goods be treated in that regard? That's useful. Um, it will be useful to get some additional feedback on that when when you um, have that as well. Um, all right, I'm going to move on and let members come in with questions. Um, members, just to remind that that we do have another two briefings this morning, so we can be as concise as possible. Gordon. Thanks very much. Hello, Michael and Aidan. Good morning. Michael. Good to speak to you again, and um, we appreciate the efforts you're making in these difficult times. Um, Michael, uh, obviously a lot of your businesses have continued to work uh, through the crisis and others obviously were unable to, but I think we need to focus and trust that soon we'll all be back you know, fully into work. Um, these businesses, do you feel there needs to be some more support given to um, getting businesses uh, fit for the restart and, and even the step up of production? And uh, what initiatives would you like to see uh, in relation to that? Well, uh, Gordon, yeah, we, we, we believe, as I say, you know, the businesses are, 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 are in, 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 in sort of three categories uh, as, 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 as we stand today. Um, our direct network of businesses, the local enterprise agencies, have continued uh, to work. Uh, like, like Aidan, we put in place... Um, uh, remote working and facilitated uh, the uh, business advisor network uh, to work from home and engage with business. Uh, and that engagement has been has been continuous day in day out, evening after evening, and through through, through the weekend, and been very productive. But we've identified those businesses in the three areas. You know, those that that, that are still continuing to trade. Some of them. Uh, and some of them, uh, there's an opportunity in the midst of the crisis, and they're doing they're doing quite well. Um, there's a big number, as we know, have both bought and hibernated, and, and there's a real um, and, and, and some have been. If you, if you go to the you know the retail and the, the hospitality, um, uh, must close down and, and, and don't have the option of, of, of opening in a, in in in, a, in in any form. Uh, and then there's the third that are that, that that are in severe trouble. But we certainly see that that going forward now we have we have it into reboot and, and, and recovery that there needs to be a province wide 
coordinated program of, of recovery uh, and rebuild. And, and that needs to be flexible as, uh, as we move on uh, through the different stages of, of, of reopening. But some of the things that we need to be looking at in, 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 in that program is, again, looking after the business owners and their team around resilience, well-being and livelihood. Really need to focus on liquidity cash flow and funding the reboot and rebuild phases. And this just includes in a very, very small way. We've been looking in detail over the last 48 hours uh, at the recommendations coming from uh, UK Gov on making workplaces COVID-19 safe. Now, 99.2% of all businesses in Northern Ireland are micro and small. Some really successful ones, but there's a lot of small businesses out there that even to, to, to put in um, some uh, screening, uh, sanitizers, maybe one-way systems, or whatever it happens to be, and that's only if it's work uh, uh, colleagues only, but then those businesses that step up and have customers uh, coming in and out, you know, we believe that there needs to be uh, a, a portal right away for Northern Ireland businesses with uh, training and templates as to how to make your workplace COVID-19 safe. And perhaps a small grant, one and a half, two thousand pounds, to help small businesses pay for some of the equipment to ensure that their workplace is, is, is safe. But going beyond that, it's working with businesses to adapt and embed new technologies for process and, and communications improvements uh, to, to uh, really help them build what are now changed relationships or fractured relationships with their supply lines and indeed their, their customers. And then we need right throughout Northern Ireland to share as much intel as we have uh, about when domestic and more importantly international markets are beginning to open up so that the many businesses in Northern Ireland that are dealing with these uh, know when and how to plan to engage with, with, with markets around the world that are opening up maybe at a different pace uh, to, to, to um, our own. So I suppose that, that's the, 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 the sort of things that we, we really uh, need to see in place in the coming. Uh, uh, and we need it on the ground very quickly, Gordon. And, and um, you know, we, we, we've said in our, in our submissions that, that, you know, Enterprise Northern Ireland Network and the Local Enterprise Agency Network, you know, 44 locations, a, it, it's, it, it's an asset and it's an active asset. Uh, that should really be harnessed in the in, in, in delivery of this comprehensive support through recovery. Great, thanks, Michael. Aidan, um, yeah. uh, good, uh, good to talk to you again, Aidan, and we enjoyed our, our visit down to, to Newry some time ago um, on yeah. the previous committee. Um, you're very welcome at any time. And uh, we saw the uh, enthusiasm that you have. You still sound as if you still have it. Uh, especially in relation to all your programmes that you run, and uh, we certainly were impressed with, with what we, we saw that day. And to be fair, the the positivity around the new area in relation to business and to business development, and it's an area I think and they get the best of both worlds uh, down there on the border in Newry, and, and business is seen to, to thrive. And you've said yourself that um, the cross border element of business has been good. And, and that's good, and we welcome that. And all the, the worries about Brexit, I think, were unfounded by, uh, in many cases. But we'll not get into all of that. Um, the extension of the uh, the furlough scheme. Uh, how do you think that will uh, be a in beneficial moving forward in what uh, we talked about the rebooting of business and the stepping up of production? I think will be a big factor uh, moving forward, and how businesses will be able to phase in bringing in employees and, and obviously limiting the number of employees within premises for a number of uh, ten, for a number of, of weeks and months. How will that be managed and how do you see challenges like that as a move forward? Yeah, um, I mean, the extension of the furlough scheme is just, I think, a, a realistic reaction uh, and assessment to how the pandemic has developed. Um, I think it, ha it had to be extended. Um, moving forward into recovery phase, as I said, you know we have a full recovery package that's focused on cross-border traders, which is Intertrade Ireland's remit. And uh, the, we only launched um, 
our eMERGE program there, which helped businesses develop online sales, and our emergency business solutions program um, about two weeks ago in, to all cross-border traders. And demand for both, both of those has been very, very high. In fact, to the extent that we're almost hitting our, 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 our delegated limits at the minute, um, uh, and, and uh, you know we could be, <laughs> we uh, we will have to review and are currently discussing with our departments how we can um, increase the availability of of those two programs. Um, so businesses are reacting and businesses are changing, and you know they're the entrepreneurs. And I think what the, in the public sector, there's two key things that we have to think about and maybe add to the support, to the very, very comprehensive support packages that have been offered um, uh, and provided by the governments, uh, the Irish government and the UK government. The first one is in terms of innovation support. Businesses do recognise that we're not, not going back to the same, that the, there will be this so-called new normal. Uh, so we need to really tailor our innovation support to um, to take account of what of maybe different types of innovation, not not the research technology type innovation, but as Michael says, there's lots of small small businesses that are having to repurpose their their how they how their business models and how they do businesses. So we will be looking at how we can support that. The other thing I think which is very important, um, there's two big issues facing business at the minute, you know, liquidity is an obviously massive one, but also during recovery will be demand and uh, I think government will have its part to play there as well and it's going to be very important. I, I think that um, in both Ireland and Northern Ireland that any large infrastructure programmes that are being planned should be brought forward as quickly as possible to help stimulate demand within the economy. Great. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you. Um, I have two um, specific questions. This morning, the Deputy First Minister said on the radio that it was possible that social distancing would continue for two years. Could you describe for me, in that scenario, what the implications are for cross-border trade, manufacturing and supply chains? Do you want to start yet? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, uh, I, I didn't see that. Um, I, I don't know when vaccines are going to come on the market, of that, but certainly across our social distancing, or uh, as we're starting to call it, uh, is safely relating, is um, is going to be with us over the the next number, of, the, the, for the foreseeable future anyway, for the medium term. Um, I think business can take place if social distancing is the only problem. We are already seeing the, the amount of people that are using new t the technology, Zoom, remote um, meetings, taking place more and more meetings over the phone, over that. But it is the second best option, uh, and I think we should be aiming to get to a situation where people can meet again, because that's the first best option. And until that happens, I think there will, while businesses will be innovative and find ways around uh, and find ways to deal with the new normal until we are back to the situation in which people can meet uh, face to face, we will certainly be a, in a second best scenario. I think we all recognise this is a public health crisis first, but there also needs to be an economy at the end of this to pay for public health provision. And in terms of this crisis that we're going through, could you describe for me what the sort of interchange and relationship between ITI and the department has been like? Yes, uh, I mean we're we're in contact with the departments as we always would have been. Uh, we've had our oversight and liaison meetings as they've taken place successfully uh, through um, teleconferences like this. Uh, we've had very close engagement with the departments, north and south in over our responses to the crisis and we sit on the uh, various committees that the department for the economy uh, has initiated in response to the crisis so we are we are content with the the interaction that we're having with the departments in this very uh, you know special situation as i said you know 
face-to-face uh, -face contact is preferable uh, and it's the first best option but it's not possible at the minute and I think the second best option is, is working uh, as well as could be expected for intertrade and uh, in regards to particular to the businesses that we're supporting we are also that managing that interchange uh, uh, as successfully as possible and uh, we have been surprised ourselves that the pipeline for uh, our main programs such as Acumen and Fusion is continuing to be quite strong which is reassuring in many ways. Just one final question Chair, this it may relate to the retail consortium later on or Enterprise NI it, it's in relation to the, the £10,000 grant payment issue we described in your presentation about businesses falling through the cracks. <coughs> An issue has been raised with me in my constituency, and it's one business, but it's actually at five different locations. And they've been told that they're only eligible for one 10k payout, even though they're operating at five different locations. Have you encountered similar and have you any information in terms of having raised that with the department and any steps that the department intends to outline to us or to you to try and uh, fix that situation? Hey, Robbie, I can, can, can yeah. step in there. There was, you know, over the last, uh, you know, identifying day in, day out, you know, and that we did the businesses that, that uh, have fallen uh, trade between the cracks. And indeed, one of those big types. That, that, that bubbled up where uh, it has multi locations or, 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 or multi sites. Um, the, the 10K grant uh, uh, was linked uh, to, to the Small Business Rates Relief Scheme, and that was just to give it a framework uh, for, 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 for delivering. And it's why a lot of businesses are sort of linked to, 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 to premises. But it has caused some issues in, 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 in the delivery. Um, because in the small business uh, uh, rates uh, relief scheme, uh, there's a, 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 a that, that, that businesses with more than three premises don't have a, a, have a eligibility for small business relief scheme. That same criteria then is not uh, businesses out of the £10,000 K uh, grant scheme. Uh, and, and you know the criteria was set for, for, for two different reasons. The grant scheme, however, is for the business, not the premises. So if 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 a particular business maybe has uh, you know four or five outlets, the, the ten thousand uh, pound uh, grant was for the business, unless on those locations the business is set up as a separate business entity, then there'll be a separate business entity with a separate uh, uh, NAV in that case, and, and they may get more than, than, than access to, to, to more than one grant, so if they were a group of, of, of businesses. Um, but it is one of the, the, the many businesses that, that have fallen, uh, uh, the types of business that have, that, that have fallen between the cracks. Uh, they should be able to get access to at least one ten thousand pound uh, uh, grant, we have done for thanks to the Christmas. We, we've been uh, liaising with uh, the, the uh, departments uh, on 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 a every other day, uh, and we highlighted at one stage we had ten different business types that had fallen between the cracks. And indeed, over the last uh, uh, two to three weeks, uh, several of those uh, have, have have been sorted, including micro and small businesses in, in shared uh, uh, workspaces. Uh, there, there's a, 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 an adaptation underway to sort those. Uh, micro and small businesses uh, in premises with less than an NAP less than, than, than uh, 1,590. Uh, they, they've now uh, uh, been, been sorted. We still have gaps uh, with businesses that, that were startups or recently self-employed over the last, last 12 months. They've fallen between uh, the cracks of all schemes, and we must not let that happen because to build up that foundation again uh, is, is so, so, so important. And then small business who, with, with maybe sole directors or one or two directors who get paid through, um, get paid through, through dividends have also fallen uh, between the cracks of all, all, all of the schemes, and we're, we're continuing to, to lobby uh, and, and highlight those. I actually raised an issue, it was forwarded on to me by uh, Mr Stewart, I actually raised an issue with the department as well. It, 
it can't be right in a situation where a small business is having to close that that payment is being made to the landlord rather than the small business. Surely the business should be getting the payment, <coughs> not the landlord. Well, my understanding, that, 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 that's a, 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 a new one to me. My understanding is it's the business, not the landlord, that, that uh, uh, should avail of the grant. If the business is closed and closed for good, well, they won't get access to the grant. The grant is there um, as, as a lifeline to uh, help uh, survival and operation for reboot. Uh, but um, uh, the landlord shouldn't be, should be availing of a grant if the, the business is closed, if their tenants' business is closed. Thank you, Chair. John Stewart. Thank you, Chair. Aidan, uh, Michael, thank you very much. John Stewart here. Um, just thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you and your questions so far. Um, Michael, just in relation to the enterprise and I, um, as a former board member of Carrick Enterprise, I just want to take my hat off to the work you and the um, various agencies are doing across the country. I know the businesses in my constituency, East Antrim, have been singing the praises, um, not just of the mentor and the support they got when they got established, but the vital support that you're offering now in these you know, unprecedented and hugely difficult times. I think just the advice and the guidance and, and continued access to that has, has been invaluable. Um, just touching on the point that you raised with uh, Christopher there, um, those that are particularly struggling, um, I know that you said some of them have been dealt with by the grants. I know in sort of point two of your 10-point um, your plan, emergency fund for micro and small business hardship fund um, is vital for those, and you say that some have been sort of dealt with. But I'm still hearing that there is gr a really great difficulty for some of those businesses accessing the grant, um, getting hold of the money, and for those that have fallen through the cracks and possibly won't live to see a recovery plan, um, should we not get them support? What can we do for them? Uh, it, 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 it's a real problem, and it's our, it, it is our big, big focus at the moment. Thanks for those comments I, 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 about the Northern Enterprise Agency Network. You know, Ian and I, over the last number of weeks, have been uh, in an update and support available. We've been translating it into the last weeks that work for micro and small businesses. With pushing that out through, through, through our network. And as I say, we've been engaging remotely with, with, with thousands of businesses uh, locally uh, every, every week and in, in a very, very practical uh, way. Um, but there are still businesses fall, you know, you know, fall, falling between, between the gaps. We, we are concerned about the sort of cliff edge cut off of the 20th of May. And um, because, you know, yesterday I, I fielded personally a call from businesses that are saying that they're, that, that they're calling the helpline uh, and uh, they, they, they're, they're not getting uh, any further help. They're in receipt, some of them, of an email uh, that says that their, their, their um, uh, application is, is, is still being considered. But as we draw towards the 20th of May, there, there is great concern still for a number of businesses uh, that have uh, short. And, Many of them, it's just because of, of um, a, a, an interpretation of the, the eligibility criteria that, that, that have been put uh, in, 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 in place. Uh, and uh, with some very, uh, you know, distinct and definitive uh, 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 examples uh, of that. And then we've still got some small clusters of businesses that seem to have as a, as a group falling between uh, the gap. Now, there's, there's no way that any scheme, and I understand this, there's no way that any support scheme uh, was going to be able to, to, to help every business. There, there, there's no doubt about that. Uh, and there are, uh, 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 you know, some businesses that, that, that won't be able to get that sort of uh, early stage uh, financial support. So that's why um, we're continuing to engage with them and why I think that it's really important that we have a comprehensive program of support with an opportunity, and we've been very successful in this uh, as well, and I think it needs to be highlighted. We have worked with some uh, of the councils locally, and, and I have to commend the councils for sitting down and repurposing some existing local economic development activity uh, to deliver COVID-19 support. You know, we've just worked very uh, uh, closely with Belfast City Council, uh, uh, as an example, on the five local enterprise agencies. And we have repurposed a kickstart program, which has sort of fallen off the cliff in terms of, of, of demand. This is that we're, we're, um, we're at, at really mothballed in, in fright. We've repurposed that. It's now providing COVID-19 support. And indeed, in that one, there's a small 
1500 pound incentive that was to be used for uh, for for a uh, growth and process development it can now be used for uh, recovery and reboot uh, and that's a great example as well and it's, it's another example though um, many of those businesses have definitely fallen between the cracks uh, because they were not in that sort of early stage business so um, I would encourage more repurposing of existing local economic development activity because if you like the money is there uh, and the framework of delivery is there let's repurpose more of that quickly and get it to some of these businesses that have fallen between the cracks Thank you. Yeah, I've just come back from a second one, if that's okay. I'll keep it very short. Totally agree with you on that, Michael. Um, there's, there's nothing worse too, though, than the, the money being, or you've been told you can access a grant and then not being able to get it. And that's proven to be the case for those with the NAV of under 1590 and those who share or who pay their rates directly to their landlord. And, and this deadline of the 20th needs to be scrapped because I don't see a point of a deadline if you're entitled to the money, but you can't get the application process to work. Um, so the final question, just a very short one, um, access to bank lending. I know there was some breakthroughs with the announcement two weeks ago, but can you just tell me briefly about your members' access to banks um, being able to get those interest-free loans at this stage? Thank you. Let me start there as well. Of course, we've done extensive work. Our, our um, November 19 business barometer looked at the relationship of small and micro businesses with, with, with banks. Uh, they still suffer in general from, uh, if you like, the aftermath of the financial crisis in that a, a significant number of small and micro businesses across Northern Ireland don't have a, 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 a mature uh, relationship with uh, their, their banks and therefore at a time of crisis uh, there isn't enough of a relationship there for them to get funding. Certainly in the initial uh, C-bills uh, launch, that just frankly didn't work at all for the majority of small and micro businesses uh, in, 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 in Northern Ireland. Then we had the, the announcement of Bounce Back, uh, and we're, we're on a day in, day out the, the basis at the moment, trying to work out how that's working for Northern Irish businesses. Uh, I, I can't give you... Big facts and figures. Anecdotally, I've talked to several businesses over the last number of days who have actually uh, gone online and got the, the bounce back loan from banks like Starling, banks like HSBC and Barclays, who seem to have been very proactive uh, and effective. You know, and and, and there's, there's been turnaround lending in, in, a, in less than 24 hours, uh, for, 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 for some example. Uh, the, the local banks are embracing it. I know Dank and Ulster Bank uh, are, are, are embracing it. We're waiting to see how, how effective that uh, has, has been. Um, a slight concern is that if some of that money is dispersed too quickly, it will, you know, um, um, you know I can remember the days on my own business that when you're in desperate need of, 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 of liquidity, money can come in and it can be like dropping water on a very hot frying pan. It just goes fizz and disappears. And then it's a debt that has to be repaid. So that's why, again, I go back to during recovery, this, this um, support uh, has been to stabilise. Businesses will need funding, sensitive and responsible funding support during recovery uh, as well. OK, thanks, Michael. Thank you. Claire? Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, Michael. I'm Aidan Claire Sugden, Independent MLA. Um, I suppose there seems to be um, a theme this morning in relation to the support for business. Um, I, I can only take that one further because it, it, maybe it's even uh, drawing on that last point that um, some of the grant monies at this stage, I feel, have now run out. And businesses um, uh, are, are still having overheads coming. Um, the furrow scheme has been great. The small business uh, support grant for those who have been able to access it has been great as well. However, we're at a stage now where those supports have run out and businesses are going to go to the wall. And I'm concerned that all of the supports for these you know, first seven weeks will have been in vain if more government support isn't uh, coming through. Um, and I uh, will reiterate it time and time again that I think a, a really good start would be to extend the, the rates holiday up to the, the year. And I, and I think Senator Murphy maybe have confirmed that they're looking at a bespoke uh, version of that um, in Northern Ireland. Um, but also the furlough scheme, I, I am, whilst that's great to hear that that will be extended to the end of October, I am concerned that a percentage of that will have to be paid by the employer, which is to be expected. But if they have no money to pay that, 
then chances are they will have to, at the end of that process, make their staff redundant. So I think whilst the supports that we have here and now are, are, are helpful, again, for those who can access it, because there are big issues for those who can't, um, I, I think there needs to be a continuity which still recognises that um, people will find themselves in difficulty, particularly if we're having a phased emergence uh, from COVID-19. And I, I think there needs to be more thinking around the impact of various businesses. So I, I, I'm keen to hear your, your thoughts around, I suppose, almost the next phase of support, financial support. Um, and another uh, point I, uh, I think others have talked about it um, too is in relation to the shared space and the access to small business relief. I, I totally agree. To, uh, to me, this support um, should have been... Um, that the small business rate relief was the vehicle, whereas the support should be for the business. But I don't think um, the departments have facilitated it, that in that way. And I do think that um, businesses have lost out because of that. And whilst I'm, I'm hopeful that the hardship scheme might mop up um, those, those businesses, I'm concerned it won't. Um, it, it's for very small businesses. And, and the phrase that keeps coming back to me is one that the minister had said to this committee a number of weeks ago, where she said it's for those in hardship. But there's many businesses who maybe wouldn't be considered in hardship, but still don't have any income coming in. So are they not going to be covered? Um, England and Wales, I think, and I'm not sure if it extends to the rest of the UK, announced a discretionary fund. I would have much preferred something like that. Maybe that's an addition to the hardship fund. But I, I still think we, we have a long way to go, and we're almost through the first phase of survival, if you like, but I do think there may be a next phase of that if, if they don't get further support. Thank you. Um, is it Aidan here, sir? I'll just uh, make a couple of points in, in response to that. I mean, um, you're undoubtedly right, and, and it has been recognised that you know this is going to go on longer, and the, the support and the subsidies are going to be required for a longer period of time. Uh, but also we need to we do need to move to an opening of the economy because mm -hmm. it, it's not a bottomless pit uh, the government's finances and mm -hmm. um, we are moving towards uh, a, a, a planned um, opening of the economy and in that regard our focus uh, and I think the focus will shift more uh, in terms of the type of supports offering being offered is to help it businesses, particularly small businesses, because that's the ones we work with, to uh, to repurpose their business models, to redesign how they work, um, uh, because we, are, we will have to adjust to a new type of economy and a new way of doing businesses, of doing business. So we will be working very closely with our businesses, those who want to be involved in cross-border trade, to help mm. them repurpose, redesign and innovate so that they can adjust their business model and um, meet any meet and create demand that's out there. Okay. Thank you. Just to add to that, we're 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 uh, government, government looks at that because the the, the, the financial part of support that uh, you know could run out very. Well. But you know, if you link it to things like rates relief, if you link to things like you know maybe um, uh, reductions on on PAYE uh, or or cancellation of PAYE as people bring you know back to work, if that's the sort of variable link to coming back to work uh, and, 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 and and recovery. Um, Plus, then uh, there has to be continued sensitive and, and, and responsible, uh, maybe lending uh, or, or combi lending uh, and, and, and grants uh, for businesses uh, to help them repurpose, as Aidan says, uh, embrace new technologies and embrace an opportunity that we have now um, to, to embrace a greener approach to, to, to mm -hmm. developing uh, our economy. Uh, and develop a strong economy that's more socially impactful, uh, because there are a lot of positive things coming through that we have been find that we would love to build in, and there's an opportunity now to build that in to the emergency emergence of a new economy and a, a, a stronger society. Um, thank you, Michael. And yes, and I think the enterprise agencies will will find themselves in a role there to be able to encourage that innovation and to be able to make businesses. 
and become more effective and more innovative, um, particularly given uh, the circumstances. Chair, if you wouldn't mind, another uh, quick question. Quick question. The, the parallel scheme to the, the... Sorry, I can't hear you. Go on ahead. We're, we're behind time, so quickly. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, the parallel scheme for the self-employment, um, I'm not sure, Michael, if you have any of your uh, uh, clients um, who would be accessing that scheme. I'm not sure how true this is. I've had a number of constituents, and I came to hear if other members have experienced the same, where they have been able to go in and check their eligibility for the self-employment scheme, which I think opens on the portal today. In doing so, there was a requirement for photographic ID, but they wouldn't accept Northern Ireland driving license, nor would they accept, accept Irish passports. Um, at the point, you know, I, I'm not sure if others have experienced that. I think it's a big issue if that's the case. Um, and, you know, just as, as, as a side note, Chair, I think that's maybe something we need to look into because I think that's quite a, a serious issue. Um, but I'm just keen to know if, if, if that's something you have come across. Uh, my thought here again, that is uh, something that would uh, uh, be uh, uh, driving license, uh, uh, business, business owners and, and self-employed people uh, not being, uh, that their Irish passport wasn't being accepted uh, as, as wow. a big ask. And um, I've, I've asked uh, uh, for, for clarification on that and yet to, to receive a, a response because if that, uh, it, we, you know, we have to get up to it. Uh, you know, misunderstanding and barriers removed uh, immediately. Yeah, no, very much so. And chair, you know, if that's something as we as we can, as a committee can chase, and I don't, I think it's not just Irish passports. I think it's Northern Ireland driving license. It, they're only accepting GB driving license. You know, which yeah, yeah. I'm, I just don't understand why not. So, if you wouldn't mind, chair. Yes, no, we will pick up on that, Claire. It is a huge issue. We've been contacted by lots of constituents who've been unable to have their identity verified through the, the online portal and they're being advised by HMRC who've said they're aware of the issue for people to contact okay. the, the helpline but the helpline is not resolving the issues either. Um, it yeah. has been raised with, with HMRC and I also have raised it with the, with the finance minister to raise with Treasury but I think we should also pick up on it with the, the minister as well. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, Sinead? Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Michael and Aidan. Um, very thorough briefing, and uh, thank you for your uh, papers as well. And um, I just want to congratulate both organisations because um, you have shown and led the way in how to repurpose the fact that you have been able to uh, repurpose some of your programmes in order to meet the needs um, of your members and clients uh, and the businesses throughout uh, Northern Ireland. And, uh, uh, and that's to be very welcome. One of the first things I probably want to say to or ask Michael about is the self-employment income, income support scheme, uh, as uh, Claire has said, that is um, live today. Um, there are a lot of gaps in that. Are you finding, I mean, I'm getting um, quite, a few, um, con uh, quite a few calls from local businesses to say that they are falling uh, down. Some of them are, you know, directors of companies uh, and they're getting paid through maybe a very low salary, maybe taking dividends and things like that there. And whilst um, the other schemes, like the furlough scheme and that, that they can they can support their employees, they themselves as the entrepreneurs and the innovators um, of, of the company, they are being left behind. And this is really, you know, this is really a, a, a probably a big, big um, problem because we need to make sure that, you know, those businesses that were viable and successful before, um, the pandemic that they um, can go back and come back again and, and be equally as innovative and, and perhaps even repurpose again. Are you finding that on the ground as well? I suppose that comes to Michael. Yes, uh, Sinead, uh, and, and uh, you know, thanks again for the for the comments and what uh, those organisations are, are are doing in these trying times. Uh, but in relation to to uh, specifically the, the self-employed. Uh, Scheme does open today. Uh, we, we've had a, a, a wave of people that are finding some of the, the, the eligibility criteria and indeed the process. And refer back to, to uh, uh, what Claire talked about there in relation to, to, to the ID as well. Um, but specifically, that one, and I mentioned it earlier on, we have been pushing and, and, and we've pushed again through the Northern Ireland office to go back to, to, to uh, UK Gov. 
uh, those businesses, and you're absolutely right, and many of us have been set up uh, and advised to be set up uh, that way, where there are sole directors or maybe two directors of, of a, a micro business. And many of these businesses, you know, up to eight weeks ago, were burgeoning and doing incredibly well, but have come across that, that lockdown cliff that many businesses have. That entrepreneurial investment and spur of there, but because they take and have done their returns in a way that they take maybe no, no or a very small salary uh, out of the business and then get paid through dividends, not so much of this uh, self-employment uh, grant. And you're absolutely right, they've maybe used, uh, maybe don't have any employees or they've maybe used furloughing to just furlough some of their, their, their teams. So you've got sole directors who, who left basis, you know, Northern Ireland is a micro and small business economy and, and uh, 130,000 enterprises. And they're, they're 72 percent of them, 62 percent of them are, are family businesses. Let's, let's remember that as well. The, the, the lifeblood of local communities. And you've got sole directors sitting in offices, and I've spoken directly to a number of them over the last uh, number of days, um, who are uh, fielding phone calls. They're trying to keep the business open. They've had to furlough their team. They're fielding phone calls. They're trying to keep uh, customer uh, uh, pathways open. They're trying to deal uh, with suppliers. Uh, and they have absolutely no income at the moment, and the self-employed scheme is not uh, uh, addressing their needs. And they have got, you know, families to feed, and in many ways, overheads of, of a business uh, still, to be, still to be paid. Uh, so it's an opportunity to come. So that's that one direct. It's an opportunity maybe to say as well, you know, one of the, the, the overheads that hasn't gone away, for example, is, 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 are, are the utility side of things and, and, and electricity. Uh, and, and with the, the, the plummeting price of oil around the world um, for um, uh, electricity uh, suppliers in Northern Ireland to come up with a, a, a 5%, and that's a domestic uh, reduction in price for next month, and no indication yet as to whether businesses are going to get a price reduction, is not helpful or constructive in the present climate. That was from the sole director suffering from several things this week that I took that call. Yeah, I mean, I have had a few very distressful calls um, from business owners, it really is. And I think in that context, we need to look at the VAT deferment uh, and, and uh, extension of the, the, the race holiday as well, because these self-employed people are actually going to go to the ground if we can't support them. And they are our lifeblood because they are our, our entrepreneurs. Now, this question is to Aidan. Aidan, um, I, I know all the work that you do in relation to um, Brexit and, uh, and the economic assessment and the impact of Brexit. Um, obviously, um, that assessment that you have done in, in relation to the impact in the economy and the all island economy and supply chains, um, that was good work. Uh, at that. But how relevant is that based on now this new catastrophe? Do you have to kind of now maybe go go back and, and look at, you know, doing um, a more impact assessment based on uh, the COVID-19 as well as, as the upcoming um, pandemic, pandemic uh, or the upcoming Brexit. And, and, and are your companies Brexit ready? You know, are, are they going to be able to deal with the tariffs of that and the search of origin? Uh, and are they still progressing in, 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 in those areas? Yeah, I mean... It's an interesting question and it's a, it's a difficult question and it's one that Intertrade Ireland is, is grappling with at the minute uh, because we are heading to a situation where businesses, you know, Brexit is going to resurface as a major issue um, and it, it already is and uh, we have to be very careful that we're giving very clear messages uh, and information to businesses. So uh, our, our initial thinking at the minute is that as we move, hopefully quickly, to a recovery phase of the economy, that the recovery packages that we will be offering will take account of the Brexit and COVID requirements. And so we're looking to, we will be looking to merge supports uh, and, and make it a, 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 a clear package of support for businesses. Because um, the, while, while Brexit will, will come with, um, we have the Northern Ireland Protocol, there are still uncertainties from our point of view in terms of cross-border trade 
and the impact of what the new the new trading relationship will with the EU will have in that. And the one area that we're particularly concerned about at the minute is, as I mentioned earlier, is the amount of um, uh, exports from Northern Ireland into Ireland that then form part of a product that is exported through a, an EU free trade agreement to a third country, and whether those um, North, how those Northern Ireland uh, components of that product will be treated. Okay, thank you. Um, John O'Dowd. Uh, thank you, and thank you, uh, Michael and Ian, for your presentation. Uh, in regards social distancing uh, and perhaps Christopher's concerns around social distancing, I, I don't think it's a case of social distancing or the economy. I think it's a case of how we acknowledge that COVID-19 is going to be with us for the foreseeable future and how we build an economy in that knowledge. And that's why I, I welcome the fact that in your presentations you have given us a number of proposals and initiatives that you are carrying out yourselves, i.e. <coughs> I think it was Michael who had mentioned uh, the portal for, for uh, businesses to contact or, or, and go into and see how do you practice social distancing and, and, and conduct your business and also in terms of the small grant because I do think we have to move from a position of cash flow and maintaining cash flow for businesses which was hugely important into how we support businesses in reopening and indeed expanding their businesses in the time ahead. So. Um, if you have any further proposals in that regard, I would welcome them. And lastly, my, my other question would be, how aware in all of this that's going on and, and all the, the massive distraction that it is, how aware are your businesses of the looming prospect of a no-deal Brexit? Uh, well, maybe, maybe I'll start. I can right. start there. Uh, the first uh, bit on thanks for, for, for uh, the question. Uh, the, the, uh, you're right. I think I think we, you know the, there's lots of terms for it: new normal, new world, or whatever. But the reality is, um, social distancing, or or or, or um, you know, even have a, a, a new term for it. All all, all our safe for living um, is is going to be with us, uh, whether it's COVID nineteen or, or or in preparation for for, for future pandemics. Uh, go, going forward, I think it will be in a, in a, in a you know, it, it will be uh, tapered and controlled, and there'll be new interventions that we'll be able to put in place uh, to, to work with. But I think to get us up and running is absolutely necessary, and we've uh, recommended, you know, examples like that, that portal where, where there'll be training uh, and templates, maybe backed up with a small grant to give small micro businesses uh, a little bit of, of, of money to put. Uh, social distancing uh, equipment or processes uh, in, in, in place. There are certain sectors that it will take longer. You know, you know, we can't the retail and, and, and hospitality. I spent most of my life in in the hospitality business. Um, you know, and, and to, to you know, ten years ago, I was involved in a in a cafe chain of thirty odd thirty odd cafes. I would be in. I just don't know how I could get those open up again. And in a sustained way, uh, practicing uh, so, so social distancing. Um, so, you know, in, in getting back to, 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 to normality again, we have to look at this in a bespoke way, and we maybe have to look at different sectors who will be able to work with elements of social distancing more effectively uh, than, 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 than others. And on the Brexit side of things, the reality is, you know, we carried out a survey back in, 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 in November. 77% of the businesses uh, were concerned about the impact of Brexit uh, on, 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 on their business, deal, deal or no deal. Uh, COVID-19 has removed Brexit from, from, from uh, the headlines. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But the business population and the wider economic support structures must continue to prepare for, for post-Brexit. Uh, business uh, activity. We had proposed uh, 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 implementation of a, an EU transition program of support, you know, targeting micro and small businesses and self-employed to navigate around external relationships, changing external relationships and changing market conditions. I agree with Aidan. We think that now needs to be incorporated uh, with a COVID-19 uh, recovery uh, support because the two will, will run hand in hand. But also incorporate it with an opportunity to embrace uh, the emergence of a, of a new economy, a more productive economy through embracing a blended approach to, to, to remote working and new technologies, and a greener economy 
uh, with business that maybe that has less travel involved in it and more efficient uh, processes. So, you know, there's an opportunity here. The, the, the Brexit challenges are definitely there uh, and, and, and scarily so. Um, alongside COVID-19 recovery, we need a blended uh, response to this. Thank you. Uh, Gary, just oh, sorry, going ahead. Uh, sorry, no, I agree with what Michael was saying there. Um, just, just to add that, you know, uh, as we emerge from recovery, I think there's a recognition as well that it, it will be um, a different type of economy. We will have to practice social distancing well into the future, but also, I mean, government economic objectives may change. There is a recognition that already, I think, that we need to move towards a more sustainable uh, level or more sustainable type of economic growth that also appreciates other inequalities and social, social justice and puts that at the centre. Um, in terms of Brexit specifically uh, and Inter-Trade Ireland, um, in many ways, yes, uh, Brexit is not. Uh, on the agenda of the vast majority of businesses at this minute. Um, we have seen that in the demand for our Brexit services, but as I said earlier, it will come back as the recovery develops um, and we see very much again uh, the, the COVID uh, recovery packages and uh, dealing with Brexit forming part of the same package. Okay, thank you. Gary? Thanks, Chair, uh, and thanks to Michael Layden for their presentations. Um, I'm just going to touch very briefly on the fact that obviously yesterday we had the uh, roadmap published by uh, the executive, and I think that that has been broadly welcomed. Obviously, there's been businesses and many uh, individuals who have been calling for the need for dates to be published, but I think the, the First and Deputy First Ministers yesterday articulated the reasons for why putting dates in actually can cause more problems than anything else, given the fact that obviously we do need flexibility. And the one date that I suppose that we can reflect on is the fact that the next review of restrictions is June 20th of May. And it's been made clear by the executive that should health advice change in the meantime, then of course we can enter phase one sooner. I, I suppose it's more maybe of a question for Michael uh, in respect of the businesses that he's been dealing with. Uh, in, the, in the space of the past 24 hours, I've been speaking to many businesses who have stressed their concern about the fact that they know where they are in terms of what stage, but they, they don't obviously know how long they're going to be waiting until they get to that point. But I think in all of this, and as I've said to them, people have been so good to this point in ensuring that we've protected lives. We also need to reflect on the fact that we still have to protect people's livelihoods as well. Are you receiving uh, much in regards to that? And how are you uh, reassuring people that, look, we need businesses uh, whilst we'll get, we, we need to get all the support and financial support in place to, to support you, but how, how are you reassuring them as well that, look, businesses need to hold tight here and ensure that we protect uh, all of the staff and all of the employees and customers going forward? Yeah, uh, yeah thanks, Gary. Yeah, we're, we're up, up to, right over the last uh, 24 hours, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the sway of the conversations has gone towards uh, 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 reflecting on yesterday's announcement. And as I said before, it's, you know, it, it, it broadly, it, the, the, the approach is that it's welcome, uh, you know, because there is real clarity uh, around the, 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 you know, the steps one to five and the criteria that are being uh, reviewed on a on a daily basis in relation to, to decision making. The import, you know, the fact that this is a health crisis and that it is it's it's lives first uh, and, and livelihoods uh, second, and that has to be be, be the case uh, certainly when when we're, we're we're trying to control that that uh, uh, our number. Uh, as I said, the the the, 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 the concerned businesses, um, you know, it's all about it's all about planning then implementation and execution of those plans. And a big uh, 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 element of all planning are, are times and timelines. So the lack of safe is, 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 is the biggest concern. A business can close down an awful lot more quickly than it can open up again. So people need, uh, businesses need a, a little bit of, of, of warning in terms of scaling up, uh, rebooting and, 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 and opening up again. Uh, so, you know, what I've been saying in terms of reassurance is that, that you know, uh, the, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister promised these 
you know, daily reviews, uh, updates, flexibility in, 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 in timelines, and that uh, step one could, could be moved a, a, a little bit uh, closer to us if the conditions and, uh, and affecting decision-making uh, are in place. Uh, and that what we must do uh, is continue what we've been doing very effectively over the last number of weeks is being, because we're the most active interface with businesses, is talking to businesses and communicating that uh, to, to uh, the departments and to, to, to the executive office uh, in a way that, that we, we, we provide that uh, re, re, reassurance. So, you know, and, and I'm saying we'll be reassured, but we'll get notice uh, that it just won't be a case of, you know, we can bring step one forward and starting tomorrow. I think there's going to be notice in there, which is uh, re really important. And we will continue, uh, you know, I, I think it's important, and we've, we've, we've fed this back as well, to look at, at uh, we've got to look at, if you like, not necessarily best practice, but practice elsewhere, uh, well, that be in, in uh, you know, anywhere really acro across the world. You know, I was looking this week uh, at what's happening in Denmark. Uh, I was looking at, at, at what's happening in, in, in New Zealand, uh, all, always in contact with, with uh, counterparts and colleagues in Scotland and Wales and in, the, in, in, in Ireland. And uh, that's uh, uh, really important uh, as well, to learn and adapt and build into our planning and um, what's working elsewhere uh, very quickly. So um, it's really about communication uh, in, in, in the next number of days uh, and, 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 and weeks, enabling small uh, and micro businesses to, to uh, adapt uh, quickly uh, and get up and running quickly, but with reassuring them as well. And if we can only reassure them that there will be a comprehensive program of support uh, with a range, with a multifaceted levels of support across liquidity support, uh, practical support, maybe grants for uh, implementing uh, social uh, uh, distance, distancing, and um, that reassurance will help. Thanks, Michael. And I just want to say in final and closing that what, what I do welcome from yourselves today, but also from uh, other bodies, is the fact that uh, when people have come to this committee and to provide, um, to provide evidence and to, to give their views, they have always come not just with problems, but they've come with solutions, and I think that, that has to be welcomed. Uh, and the solutions that you have uh, provided in the paper, you know, I, I can take certainly from our party's perspective, that we'll ensure that we can pass those on, along with the committee's concerns, effectively to, to the appropriate minister as well. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Both, um, and I would reiterate Gary's point there about the the, su the suggestions, the practical suggestions that you have put forward this morning have been very useful. We will be passing those on to the department, and also the reflections around the new ways of working and the need to incorporate decarbonisation into recovery plans. I think have all been well made, as well as the need to communicate effectively over the time ahead with businesses in terms of this stages of recovery. So thank you both very much for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. If I could just pick up a couple of things before we move on. Um, just members, I think there's a couple of things coming out on that that we would like to um, action or suggest actions on. Um, I think if we could perhaps get some um, representatives of the insurance um, industry into committee and maybe the FCA as well, if we, we could do that. Um, to communicate some of the, the issues that have been highlighted to, I know, various members over the, the past few weeks in relation to insurance and also those issues to do with credit insurance. I, I, I've seen some stuff this morning on, on Twitter around that. Um, the uh, suggestions there around the portal for training and um, for the types of measures that businesses yeah. would need to put in place, I think it's a really good suggestion and I think we should reflect that through to the Minister particularly for different sectors to, to access support relevant to themselves. I think. Um, and obviously we have asked for the Brexit officials next week, so we will have the opportunity to pick up on some of the points that were made there in relation to that. Do the members have anything else they want to suggest in relation to what we've heard this morning? I suppose, Chair, there's been some talk about financial support of perhaps smaller amounts, you know, for uh, the smaller businesses. Start up with the reboot is a term is used regularly. Um, maybe that's something that could come work out through the councils or. Oh, that was it. We were going to suggest we get folks into the committee to talk about what those um, suggestions that have been made there about repurposing the economic development um, work within councils. So that yeah. would tie in with 
Okay. Don't think that's important. We yeah. to get oh, some I think the businesses are also looking clarity on the forty thousand or the forty million hardship fund. Mm. When clarity will come around, that that seems to be an area. Well, is an area of concern. Yeah. I think it will happen. Okay. Next week. And um, just additionally, Chair, can I come in, please? Yes, uh, go ahead, Sinead. Um, yeah, I think that there were was some good points there raised, uh, and one of them that we probably didn't get. Um, talking to Aidan about was um, the Brexit vouchers and how a similar kind of Brexit COVID voucher maybe could be used for, you know, wider business organisations and wider groups so that they can actually repurpose their business. And I think that's a really important one. Uh, and, and we've learned that uh, the, the, the minister, Minister Dawes, is, is coming to the Assembly with a, a recovery programme. And it might be interesting if we pass some of, of this information on to the department and on to her office. Uh, because there has to be some kind of uh, financial um, uh, interventions made um, to help support businesses to, to be COVID ready uh, when they're out trying to uh, work in the new normal uh, and um, also probably to still support those businesses that are falling between the cracks. In the course of this morning's meeting, I've been contacted by constituents who've been unable to get their ID verified. That's that's potentially Absolutely. something that the finance committee can help with mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Um, Chair, it might be helpful if we do again what we did last week in terms of organising a time to do a triage video call as well. If I get, if I gather up all the information we've had thus far, we do this again with the, the subsequent briefings, um, and then we we get a, a video call organised with members just to triage through that and ensure that we've got all the ideas gathered up. Um, if I try and organise that either for tomorrow or Friday. Yep. Thank you. Um, so moving on then to our, our next briefing, we have Glenn Roberts from Retail NI and Aidan Connolly from um, the NI Retail Consortium. Um, are you both on the line there okay? Uh, thank you and apologies for keeping you waiting. We seem to keep running over time in our briefings. Um, but we, we're very eager to hear what you have to say this morning. So if you want to give a, a briefing and then members will pick up with questions. Um, Glenn, do you want to go ahead? Aidan, up to you. Okay, thank you very much, Glenn. That's terribly nice of you. Um, right, so folks, uh, firstly, thank you very much, Chair and, and committee members, for the opportunity to speak to you uh, today. It's, it, it's very welcome. Um, Basically, COVID is the biggest external factor to affect our business and our consumers in, in, in generations. It needs to be remembered that retail already had significant challenges before this virus arrived. Um, we were under a huge period of, of transformation. In the past five years, there's been more change in retail than there has in the previous 50s. Um, March was really a, a month of opposites for us. You know, the first two weeks of March, um, sales were up by about 12%, and that was mostly driven by stockpiling. Uh, quite frankly, when there was no need. But even those goods that were being bought were mostly low profit margin and, and low value items, so cheaper cuts of meat and protein, cheaper toilet rolls, cheaper staples. Um, whereas the second half of March, things sort of fell off a cliff, and it was the lowest sales figure since records began in, in 1995. Um, profit margins have dropped significantly, uh, as well as that year-on-year -year figures since then have, have been down. How people are shopping has changed uh, significantly. Added to that, costs have gone up, food costs have gone up, and, and our members and, and, and Glenn's members have been absorbing that. Um, global prices in, in dairy, vegetable oil, sugar markets in particular uh, have gone up. In February, global commodity prices were up 8.1%. Sugar on its own was up 13.9%. And that hasn't translated into uh, prices at, at the pills going up that same amount because retailers have been absorbing it. No. I'm sorry to interrupt you there. Apparently there's a difficulty with microphones. We have to pause for a wee second. Five minutes just so they can check them up. If I just turn off, you'll still be connected. Is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Uh, apologies um, to you both there, Aidan and Glenn, um, for the interruption. If we're, we're live again now, so if you want to continue on, Aidan. Uh, I've often thought that my face could maybe break mirrors, but I didn't think that my voice could break microphones, but there you go. Um, we, uh, so I, I was basically saying about March and, and how March um, was a, a, a tale of, of, of two halves. Um, the fact that we were up 12% at the start, um, and that was mostly driven by stockpiling, but it was very low profit margin items. 
um, and the second half of March and since then, uh, both footfall uh, and spending has, has fallen off, uh, off a cliff. Um, costs have continued to go up driven by global prices. Now, uh, retailers, Glenn's members and my members have, have absorbed that, especially when you look at you know global commodity food prices in February were up at 0.1%, in March it was something similar. Sugar on its own was up 13.9%. Now, that has not translated into price rises in the same amount on the shelves, quite simply because retailers are, are absorbing that. We're also having significant costs for those retailers who are open. Um, you're talking that uh, there's already been a cost of over $130 million across the UK implementing social distancing. In Northern Ireland, that's over £5 million. For um, shops that have had to close... Um, it's really uncertain time. Um, we have even seen large retailers go into administration over this time. 59% of non-food retailers say their ability to trade was significantly impacted. Of those with uh, closed stores, only 48% are trading online, uh, and 13.5% have actually had to close their online uh, offer. Um, of those who are closed, 72% only have one to four months cash reserves, and that's even with the furloughing and the current rates really. And that's a big worry. That the longer this goes on, the uh, less chance there is of our high streets looking uh, anywhere similar to what uh, they did. Um, there are tens of thousands of jobs at risk in Northern Ireland if we, if we don't get that right. Um, for us, um, we have been working um, uh, with uh, the uh, Northern Ireland Executive Engagement Forum. Uh, we have brought out our own um, good practice on warehousing and distribution. The priority for us, for those stores that have been open and, and even for those who, who are work, working um, as an online, has been um, to protect our colleagues and, and to protect our consumers. So we've brought back that, uh, brought in that good practice. We've also written uh, guidance on implementing social distancing ahead of reopening non-food stores. Um, we've spent uh, millions on, on implementing social distancing. Um, our costs have gone up because we've also had to backfill jobs for colleagues who have had to self-isolate, as well as hiring new staff to be with the growing demand for labour-intensive activities such as delivery and click and clack. That means that we've had to um, uh, invest in new trucks, uh, in new infrastructure for, for, for that delivery. Actually, we're delivering now. Some, some members are delivering uh, the amount that they thought they'd be doing eight years from now. Uh, quite simply because it, it, it's grown that much. We've also spent millions on things like uh, hand sanitizer, purse back screens. We've had to hire extra security staff uh, to keep um, uh, shoppers and, 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 and colleagues staff. Um, we've also worked with the Department of Communities to deliver uh, priority slots for those who are on the, the vulnerable list. We're supporting food banks. Um, it's, it's one of these ones uh, where you know I'm very, very proud to say that I work in retail at the moment because of how... Um, those who have been open especially have stepped up to the mark and those who haven't been uh, able to open are looking after their, their staff but those who have opened have really stepped up to the mark and, and are delivering not just for their colleagues, not just for their, their shoppers for, but for the, the whole community. Now we've been very grateful um, to the executive for their uh, response and, and uh, things like the new sector list, new safety measures on, on, on phased re reopening um, and we're very grateful to the time that ministers have given us during the crisis to discuss the challenges. Um, but we're, we're going to need more support. Um, most urgently, we need the rates break to be moved from three to, to 12 months in line with Great Britain. We're a property-heavy industry, and that means, yeah, other than, than staff, business rates is, is our, our biggest um, outgoing. Um, we need to look at other ways of, 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 of supplementing and, and supporting uh, the industry, because you've got to remember, there may be 100,000 people who work in retail, uh, but there are lots more who are supported by retail in agri-food, in service industries, in cleaning, in construction, and it's those ones that we need to think as well as, as the, um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the the retail industry it, itself. Um, I could go on about what the industry will look like afterwards, but I, I want to give uh, Glenn some time and then we can get into the, the questions and, and I can come to that then. But again, thank you very much um, for, for the opportunity. Um, the big takeaway I, I would like you is that we need continued government support uh, to ensure that not only can we survive this, but that we can be a pillar of, of, of regrowth, and, that, and that's what we want to do. Thank you. Glenn, are you there okay?
Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. Um, and it's, it's good to get an opportunity to present to your committee this morning. I, I think that, uh, as Aidan rightly says, everybody appreciates that this COVID-19 is an unprecedented public health emergency. Uh, and we get that the health of our community, the health of, our, of all our people has to come first uh, in whatever solutions that we arrive at. But I think that what we've been very clear on, that we're not focusing on the problem, we're, we're focusing on what the solutions are. And I think that the reality is that until we have a vaccine, we're going to have to live with this virus and reorder our economy around it. And indeed, just as the virus is a, is a threat to health, so too is poverty, for, and particularly obviously for physical uh, and indeed mental health as well. And that's why we need to reopen our economy in a way that is based upon sound medical advice. And I think just to pick up on some of the things the executive has done, we welcome the 10K and 25K uh, grants. I think particularly obviously looking at those grants that are done very differently in Northern Ireland than they are in the rest of the UK. We need to have uh, particularly multi-site uh, businesses in retail and hospitality. Those grants don't reflect those businesses. For instance, if you own two or three shops, you have two or three sets of overhead, uh, two or three sets of rates that you've got to pay. Um, and we want to see the grants as they are in the rest of the UK reflect that reality. Uh, and obviously, we look forward to seeing what Minister Murphy produces in relation to the further extension of rates relief in a targeted way. I think the other things that just to, to call out, we welcome the uh, executive plan, particularly in around local uh, city and coal scene. I think that's absolutely a vital part of our recovery. I think we, we've always been a big champion of city deals, but I think even, I think particularly in the post-COVID-19 uh, economic environment, they have an even more invaluable role. And of course, any recovery plan for Northern Ireland must be based upon not just our, our towns and cities, but also our villages as well. Um, and I think that for, for us, um, looking at what was announced yesterday with the five-step plan, I think it is, uh, it is progress. Uh, I think it is good that there is, in, as a priority, the reopening of non-food retail. Um, but we believe that um, there needs to be clear indicative timings and dates uh, in that plan. And if you look at the uh, plan for England that was announced earlier in the week by the Prime Minister, it actually has a date of June uh, for a target date for those retailers to reopen. And we believe with the right social distancing, that is definitely achievable for Northern Ireland. And of course, if we have more workers returning to retail and other key sectors, then we will need appropriate childcare provision. I think that is one of the gaps uh, in the plan that was announced yesterday. Um, with the schools closed, um, and more workers potentially returning, uh, we need to ensure this correct childcare uh, provision. And indeed, that's one of the things we've picked up with many of our members in the food side that's opening at the minute. Uh, they are actually really struggling to work around a complete lack of childcare provision in many, uh, in many uh, situations. And as I think has been rightly pointed out, since the beginning of this crisis, uh, we've seen Footfall and trade in our town and city centres all but collapsed. And um, we believe, and our central message to you today is both our organisations believe it is now time for the executive to begin work on a reopening plan for our town and city centres, which, which will ensure, obviously, the right health and safety guidance for retailers, key businesses and town centres, and their employees. This reopening strategy could include things like a common plan for public space, enhanced cleaning, sanitising consistent signage, ensuring disability access, stewarding public transport and car parking. And indeed, such a plan would need a partnership approach between council, the executive, retail and hospitality. And I think that for those things, that would start the ball rolling. Indeed, that the preparation would now begin uh, for potentially reopening our economy in a safe way that is both putting the needs of workers uh, and indeed uh, the community uh, as a whole. I think that there's other things that we need to do in terms of locking in that recovery. Uh, for instance, you know, more longer term support for high streets, including rejuvenating retail destinations, uh, creating town a town centre fund, which is there in the rest UK, further support for bids, 
uh, an advisory group on economic recovery, which retail has a key part to play. Uh, but I think that you know what we want to try and ensure is that we have a recovery plan, which, as I said at the start of the presentation, uh, work, it ensures that we can work around as best we can this virus in a safe way. Uh, the reality is until we get that, that vaccine, we're going to have to look at safe ways of reopening our, our economy. And I think that, uh, and that's why that today that we are putting forward a number of ideas about how we think we can do that in a safe and productive way. Thank you, Chair. Thank you um, both for, for your presentations. Um, I think I probably speak on behalf of all members when I, I would reflect the appreciation of, of all those um, who have been working in retail over the past number of weeks and who have um, stepped up to the mark in terms of that. Um, and uh, of course, the, the agile and responsive nature of, of the retail industry in terms of um, this crisis. Uh, in terms of some of the points that you've made, I, I guess um, in the continued government support that was announced yesterday in terms of the job retention scheme extension um, and the ability for it from August to include um, part time work, those who are working on reduced hours. Um, will, will be important. I just wanted to, to get your reflections on the, the additional types of support that might be required um, and the measures that have been put in place by um, retailers in terms of social distancing uh, could be a, a useful model, I suppose, for others in terms of best practice um, and just to get some idea of how um, that could potentially be ruled out. Uh, Peter, if we could maybe look at um, yeah. how we could feed that type of information in as well. And your points around multi-premises it, it have been raised a number of times. Um, we have reflected those to the department as well. And, and obviously the, the point you made around you know those individual premises continuing to have overheads, um, continuing to have to pay individual rates and all the rest, obviously having the rates holding at the minute, but they are individual available premises. So I, I do think that is something that does need to be addressed. Um, so I, I'll stop there and let you just kind of respond um, initially. So on, I suppose on the, 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 uh, what was announced yesterday, it is, uh, yeah, it, 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 it's good that there will be a continuation. And um, we, how, we, when, when we make that change is going to, or when we start reopening is, uh, important, but how we reopen is, is very important as well. And a lot of people are looking at this horizontally. So this is the sector we want to open. This is the sector. But what they need to be doing is looking at this vertically. So who are the sectors that supply in uh, to that uh, sector to allow it to open? So for example, with some shops like clothes shops, you could be talking that there could be maybe five, six days, maybe a week before they, they could open all they really needed their staff in the stock and to bring people off furlough. Other ones, um, one fast food retailer I was talking to needs three or four weeks because they have a very complex supply chain and they need to make sure that everything is there from the food to the, uh, the, the comestibles and the, the consumables that they need for every day. So that's going to you know, be really important. We do need to get some sort of a time frame uh, and a timeline put on that. Now, not to say this is when we do one, this phase one, two, three, and four. Uh, but if there was a good starting, uh, uh, an idea when we were going to start this so we could start planning, that would be really useful. As far as the guidance, um, the BRC, uh, the British Retail Consortium of, of whom we're part, um, has uh, done some work with us on uh, on, on uh, warehouse. Uh, it, it, it's really simple things, um, you know, like leaving a door open that doesn't need to, if, if it's not essential to be closed because people don't touch it. And it's little things that you wouldn't think of. We have shared that guidance. We've shared guidance on social distancing, um, not just with the retail industry, but for everyone. Um, I've also been part of that Northern Ireland Executive Forum and we put safety guidelines together um, uh, on how to uh, work re re responsibly uh, and how to create safe workplaces. And that's not just business, that's the unions, that's the Labour Relations Agency, that's the Public Health Agency, and the Northern Ireland Health and Safety Executive, who are all on that body uh, as well. So there, there is a lot of good stuff. I think there's a little bit more work that needs to be done as far as communicating, um, so that the biggest of our members, right down to the smallest, has everything at their at their, their, their fingertips. But um, there's a growing bank of, uh, of of knowledge on this, and I think those 
businesses, should it be manufacturing, right through to, to, to retail who are open at the minute, um, also have a part to play in, in, in that education about what works and, and, and what, not, uh, what doesn't work, uh, quite simply because it has been a bit of a baptism of fire for a, a, a lot of employers and, and there have been a lot of good lessons that have been learned. Yeah, I mean, just, just to follow on that there, I mean, you know, obviously social distancing for many small shops has been a big challenge. Um, obviously, it's settled down a bit now, but it's been an expensive process as well because, you know, they're, they're having to completely retrofit their stores, having to pay a, a significant amount of money in terms of perspex screens. Um, a lot of the smaller stores are policing the social distance themselves. So, for instance, you know, there, you have staff that are doing the one in, one out. But I think that what we're saying is in terms of, of, of reopening the rest of our retail sector, we believe that a target date of June, uh, start of June, is realistic. I mean, we could, you know, because we can show how social distancing can be done for others, for those non food retailers. And of course, you know, there's good practice there that we can show. I think there are some practical issues there in relation to, for instance, how fashion retailers reopen. For instance, will they be able, will their customers be allowed to try on clothes? Um, so there are issues there. But I think that you know, what would help if we had that wider town centre reopening strategy, um, so we can look at the sort of the, the bigger picture uh, around that sort of reopening plan uh, in, in uh, or retail reopening plan in June. I think that would be very helpful. And of course. You know, there's a significant amount of preparation needed for you know a town centre reopening strategy uh, because obviously you know councils have a key role, executive departments, retail, hospitality, and so on. But I think if we can begin talking about what that reopening plan would look like, um, I think, and then when, when the medical advice gives us to go ahead, then we can hit the ground running. So it's important we move this debate on, and it's important that we have clear plans. And of course, everything that we're saying is predicated on the medical advice. We are following the science, we're not challenging it, because our, our biggest priority is the health of our community. You know, and obviously from a retail perspective, that is ensuring that it's, it's, not, it's not just shop staff, but shoppers as well, that their health is absolutely paramount. And of course, maybe the last thing if I can say, it's just a big shout out to those retail workers that are out there, that are in the front line, putting their own health at risk, making sure that uh, you know, people in our community have got the, the food and other important products they need. And I think it's, you know, whilst we rightly all clap the uh, NHS staff and can hope that always is the case, but we shouldn't forget um, the huge uh, debt that we owe many of those hardworking retail staff as well. I agree with that, definitely. Um, just in relation, I suppose, to the, the work of the, the forum and providing the social distancing, I, I guess is that more sector-specific um, guidance that would be useful and the, the experience or, or retail will be very useful in, in, um, in terms of the moving forward with that. Um, Christopher, your first one. Yes, panel. thank you, and thank you for your briefing. I think. Um, over the course of this period, I think society has changed its mind over who's more useful, my wife who works in retail or me. Maybe they haven't changed their mind, maybe they were always of that opinion. Um, in terms of uh, businesses that are presently designated uh, as non-essential, are there any that are presently designated that way that you think shouldn't be? I think that's one of the problems uh, that um, well, it, it was great to have that sort of lift of retail that could open immediately and, 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 and stay open. Um, and it sort of gave people a certain amount of confidence and it allowed things to keep moving. But one of the drawbacks and even uh, the drawbacks within uh, the five step plan is that it is very much a, 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 a tar and a brush um, and, and, and instead of looking at individual circumstances. Now there are, uh, you know, th there's a move already as far as those uh, garden centres, um, but I, I, we're, we're having, um, you know, and one of the reasons is because they can quite easily social distance and quite easily put things in, in place. But I'm having quite a few conversations and I know Glenn is as well with different people who run everything from fast food restaurants to 
uh, shops that have uh, not only floor space but are, are able to. So I think this is where they, they, there becomes a, a friction between these are the, the, the rules uh, and whether or not it's guidance or, or not, because there are some people who are, for example, and um, there was one in, in Portadown um, who is the, the, the rather uh, strange uh, mix of a motorcycle shop and a cafe. He was on to me yesterday explaining um, that they have plenty of floor space, but uh, and they're able to put in social distancing, but they won't be able to open until stage five when they have a lot more uh, room than, say, uh, hairdressers, that sort of thing, which, which is in, in, in step four. And I do think that is, is, is a drawback. If there was a way for us to have some sort of adjudication on a retail by retail or a case by case basis in, in retail and other sectors, that might uh, that, that might speed things uh, uh, along. At the end of the day, as Glenn said, our priority is very much our customers, it's very much our, our frontline uh, colleagues, but if we can play our part in restarting the economy and getting things moving again, and we can do that safely, there shouldn't be a, a drawback to doing it. Yeah, and, and Chair, if I, if I can't just to answer Christopher's point, you know, I, I think it's, it's in terms of, I've been speaking to a lot of uh, retailers, if you like, on that on essential this night. Get that term non essential because obviously every retailer is essential to our economy and to our community and to our town centres. They're keen to reopen. Um, um, they're keen to say, look, we can reopen. And of course, if we, if we can get more of those businesses reopened, that means that there's less reliance on the furlough scheme. Uh, that boosts, as Aidan rightly said, the supply chain. Uh, uh, and it uh, obviously ensures that our economy begin to have a real recovery uh, in our economy. I think in terms of looking at what yesterday's plan said, it, it lists, if you like, those non-essential retailers as stage two. I think we should bring that forward to stage one. I think it is absolutely doable that we could ha start to allow those retailers to reopen uh, in June uh, in the same way that's envisaged in the English plan, again predicated on the uh, medical advice and that's why if you start doing that that's why you need that alongside that you need that sort of town center reopening plan as well mm -hmm. and of course one other important aspect is, is child care um, because if we're seeing more and more workers come back into the workplace the child care issue needs to be solved because you know at the start of this because a lot of our, our members staff are key workers you know the, the local schools you know, uh, obviously, uh, we're severely restricted. Some say, look, it has to be one parent, or others say it has to be two. But that side of things has been very, very difficult. So that means that we need a strategy to look at how a lot of maybe the privately owned uh, creches, childcare facilities can reopen in, in a safe way to support those workers re-entering the economy. And obviously, particularly if our schools are going to be closed until September. So the childcare piece, is, is important as well to give that further support to our, our member staff. Um, okay, one of the very few good things that has actually come out of this, and if you if you're down the, the Craigor Road or the Woodstock Road on a Saturday, you see it, is the support for small business, particularly things like butchers, bakers, fruit shops, stuff like that. How do you think we can sustain that once this passes? Well, I, I do think that um, you know many of those are, are the unsung heroes, um, and I think that um, you know we, we we actually see before this crisis a bit of a renaissance uh, in local butchers, um, and I think that it, you know it's good to see that has continued uh, you know throughout the, the, this uh, crisis. I think that you know what we've always said is that it's about creating that twenty first century high street model. Um, which is an ecosystem of lots of different types of businesses, but which is, is, is absolutely centered on the notion that we're all part of the same community. It's about serving the community. And indeed, you know, I mean, there's been a bit of a misnomer going around that some of our convenience stores that are open are somehow raking it in. They're not. They're just about holding on. Um, they've had to pay for very expensive uh measures in the store, prospect screens, restructuring the entire store. Um, but a lot of them felt it was their community responsibility and their duty to serve their customers and to stay open. And, and I look at the example in many small rural towns and villages where, you know, 
the convenience store, the butchers, the pharmacy store are an absolute lifespan, particularly for many vulnerable members of the community. And they see themselves very much as providing almost a, a public service. Um, and I think that is, that, that's a crucial role uh, that they've been playing throughout this, this crisis. So this idea that, that those retailers that are open on the food side that are raking it in, um, that's not true. They are struggling to stay open. They're just about holding on. And that's why we're saying that things like uh, rates relief should we just concentrate on those stores that are closed. It has to support those stores that are just about holding on and staying open because you know, those, we've lost a lot of those stores. They've had, a lot of them have had to close. And I think it's about keeping them open, supporting them through this crisis, because ultimately if you support them, you're supporting the local community. I suppose it's one thing, if you're one of those local shops, it's one thing before this when you were selling you know, a cup of coffee at £2.50 and you had lots of people buying that, but you're now selling a bag of rice at £1 and that's what the demand is for. It's for people buying goods like that rather than stuff that they've previously been in for. So there may be more people outside the door, but they're not buying the high-priced stuff that they would have been in the past. That's exactly, that's exactly right, and even with the, the large retailers um, and you know, right through to the small, the retail is a high volume, uh, low profit margin uh, business. Whenever I started in this role about eight years ago, you were talking to the average supermarket was running uh, around five percent profit margin. Now you're talking that it's you know below two percent, um, and um, what we saw, even when people were stocking up, they were going, instead of going for luxury brand coffee, they were going for own brand coffee. Instead of buying steaks, and I know this is particularly uh, a, a, a hard point for, for, for our farming community, instead of buying steaks and those high uh, value proteins, they were buying chicken or they were buying even mints. Mints was flying out the door as soon as you, you, you put it in there. And I think that's one of the things that we see whenever consumer confidence takes a knock. It's not just how much money they spend, it's what they buy, yeah. and that has a knock-on effect for, for retailers large and small. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, John Stewart? Thanks, Chair. Uh, John Stewart here. Nice to speak to you. Thanks for your presentation and your answer so far. Um, just to echo what's been said by everyone as well, just to sing the praise of everyone who is continuing in retail to do what they're doing, going above and beyond the call of duty. I mean, you're seeing free deliveries to the elderly and the vulnerable mm -hmm. at their own cost, and people are coming in on the front line um, in difficult circumstances, not knowing their backgrounds and difficulties with childcare. So, I mean, I take my hat off to them all. And as you know, I'm in retail, my family's in retail ourselves, so we know the demands, especially on the owners of those companies. You're working seven days a week sometimes for very little reward. Um, so I think what they do need though is clarity and Glenn you touched on the potential maybe to get back by June for some sectors and that would be welcomed especially in, 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 in fashion retail as you know pe companies buy seasonally. Um, they will have been selling off their winter wear whenever this crisis began. The summer stuff will have been ordered. And if it's not in the stores by June, it's not going to be able to be sold. And they probably haven't got their winter order in yet. So, I mean, I think things like that just need to be thought about in terms of, you know, how um, companies can actually cope and how they can actually get to sell their goods. Also, I mean, in terms of preparing for implementing social distance and protecting customers and staff, we look how long it's taken some companies to get in Perspex springs, screens, for example, because of the demand for those. Um, I think retail would need a, a bit of a heads up before that so they could make those same, um, same uh, installations as well. Um, and just also, um, you touched about the grants. Um, I'm fully supportive of that in terms of getting uh, multiple sites that have multiple rates. If, they're pay if they've made the investment in their business and they've made the investment in premises and are paying five or six sets of rates, it's only right that they, that they get that support. So um, I do hope that that is something that can be ruled out by the finance department because it seems grossly unfair. Um, so just interested to hear what you have to think about that. And also, what areas of retail you think particularly are going to struggle with getting with implementing that social distancing because we're talking about trying on goods and face-to-face -face, um, fittings and things some of that will be very difficult and i'd be interested to hear your creative thinking on how we can maybe solve that going down the road thanks guys well i think john i think that that you make some very good points there i think that you know what we have out there is a lot of small food retailers uh, who have had to adapt and i think many that could provide a model of good practice for their colleagues in fashion or electrical, 
uh, and all the rest of it. And of, of course, you know, once we allow those other types of retailers to reopen on the non-food side or that non-essential side, that's going to obviously hopefully increase some degree of footfall, which will you know, support uh, those, that sort of wider town centre uh, economy. I think in relation to um, the grants, and don't get me wrong, we're very grateful for the work the executive has done on the 10K and 25K. The one thing that we've picked up, and I'm sure as constituency uh, MLAs you've picked up as well, is that we're having ongoing problems with the, the, the uh, accessing the website application. There's ongoing problems of, 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 of retailers applying for this, but, you know, that they, they have not back in terms of the website or there's some problems, uh, technical problems. Those need to be resolved because we're running out of time because 20th of May is the deadline for uh, for for, the, for these schemes, so we need to ensure that, that, that the tax is right. But in terms of the multi-site, that is crucially important. It's a bit elsewhere in the UK, and I think it has a crucial role to play in supporting those uh, multi-site retailers. And of course, it's not just retail, it's hospitality as well. Um, you know, if you own one or two or three bars, uh, you pay you know, two or three sets of rates, two or three sets of overhead, uh, all the rest of it. So these grants need to reflect the reality of where many independent retailers and hospitality businesses are. In terms of rates relief, I think it needs to be done, and we have said, it needs to be done in a targeted way, on a triage approach, helping get the rates relief to businesses that need it the most. And that has to include businesses that are struggling to stay open, as well as those that are closed. But I do think it is eminently doable that we could get uh, most of the non-essential retailers up and running, at least by June, uh, a lot, and I think that that, that that I could be done, and I think that would be a major step forward uh, in terms of, of a recovery plan, reopening our town and city centres. But again, again, health warning is critical in, the, in this. We need to do it in a safe way, and that's why, for instance, in a town centre plan, you would have, you know, for instance, hand sanitising, cleaning. You could sort of the councils maybe perhaps in, in major towns and cities providing stewards to assist people with uh, social distancing. Um, should, you know, there's obviously going to be in some town centres you're going to have to change the layout of, of some of the streets. So that brings in issues as well in terms of car parking and public transport. But look, let's start doing this stuff now. Even if the science doesn't let us at this minute, let's start the preparation for this now. Um, there's no reason why we can't start the preparation for this now. Uh, and of course, if we get this right, when the eventual reopening of hospitality, and you know, hospitality here is key to our town and city centres, retail and hospitality are two sides of the same coin. It, you know, at least if we can have the partial reopening of our town and city centres, that's going to help eventually when we can re reopen our bars and restaurants as well, if that prep is already done. Thanks, I think it, as far as I uh, agree with Glenn, rates relief needs to move from 3 to 12 months. It's, it, it's just that simple. Every shop needs to stand on its own two feet, and to do that, we need uh, the same opportunities as there is in, in Great Britain. Same with the multi sites. Yes, that's the exact same thing. And it goes back to uh, each shop having to stand on its own two feet. The only thing that I would add is as far as those shops who are able to open, it's not just enough to say you are able to open. Um, a lot of shops, especially when you were talking there about fashion retail, so fashion retailers, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, even Thursday aren't that busy. Friday, Saturday, Sunday is where they do the majority of, of their business. So they need to have the critical mass of a couple of people in browsing and one person buying or two people buying. And if, if there isn't that critical mass and if there isn't that ability to get that amount of people needed into the store, then there's no point in them open as they will uh, inevitably lose, lose money. So... There's a, there's a lot that needs thought out here, not just as far as when they can open and how safely they can open, but the, 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 the planning that needs to, to, to go into that and be aware of the actual circumstances of, of retail aren't the fact that it's the same amount of trade every day. You will get days that are a lot busier than others and, and you need to make hay while the sun shines. Absolutely. Thank you very much, guys. Thank Pretty you. Sure. Gordon? Thanks, Chair. Uh, Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good to talk to you again. Um, there, I think there's no doubt the, the retailers, the local retailers, have, have stepped up to the mark, and I think we're all uh, very much appreciative of what they've done.
I was thinking the other day, it's the ordinary people out there that are risking their, their lives and, and been going out working every day and continue to deliver the goods and putting them on the shelves for all of us to get easy access to. And I think all credit to the whole retail sector in that and they've been the vital part of the food chain and uh, as a result, in the main, fresh food has been on the shelves for the public out there to get access to. And of course, we appreciate the efforts that was made to, uh, for businesses to diversify, we're able to diversify and to do home deliveries, which has been a, a great benefit to a lot of our constituents. So we do really appreciate the, the efforts of uh, put in by the retail sector, and we all know the, how much pressure they've been under. Just two points I would make. Do you see uh, more opportunities for fresh local produce? Uh, which is of good quality and is uh, available, now being uh, sought after by our local customers. And two, what about the challenges of online? I must say I'm surprised at the amount of online business that has continued, uh, even within our, our own local neighbourhood, uh, throughout uh, the whole crisis. And the, the van men have been extremely busy from what... I see, and I do worry about that ongoing challenge. And I was talking to a local retailer at the weekend, and they're worried about the public will not browse anymore. And to me, I hadn't thought of that, but I think it's an important issue that people will not come in and browse in the shops because um, they not want to be in, in contact, I suppose, with, with the public. So I think those are important factors. Um, mainly about the challenge that we all know. There's, that is, it's not new, the challenge of online, but I think it has increased. And what worries me is that people will have got used to the, the convenience of online and they'll, they'll not just rush back to retail. And we do want them back and we want them into our town centres to help to regenerate the, the places. Well, I think that's, that's, a, that's a very good point, Gordon. I think that one of the things, obviously, we need to ensure is that our town, street, our town centres and our high streets are safe. Yeah. places obviously and that's why the medical and we need to be led by the science and all of this uh, and so that we can create confidence for consumers to eventually come back to our town and city centres I'm looking at the longer term um, what we've got to do is create you know a 21st century high street town centre model which is all about the experience about making it a fun family friendly uh, day out for people and shoppers and I think that means that we develop an ecosystem model of town centres, which is, is not just retail hospitality, but lots of different types of business in there. So we create that experience. And I suppose that's one way of how we get people away from their keyboards. Uh, and I think, you know, if we do get to the point of the next few months with a lockdown-weary population, uh, I, you know, I think we can turn that around. Yeah. But you know what? The, the, the re before this crisis, retail was going through a period of construction. It was changing. It was changing beyond all recognition. And I think that this crisis has, I feel like, supercharged that even more. So, you know, we are to a certain degree in uncharted territory. Uh, but I think that, you know, it, it reinforces the point that we need to start planning on for reopening our town centres, allowing the non-essential retailers to reopen next month. And let's start moving the situation forward. Uh, Gordon, uh, thanks for your questions. Uh, good to talk to you again, as usual. Um, on the fresh local produce uh, point, um, retailers already buy uh, between 2.6 and 2.7 billion pounds of Northern Ireland agri food every year, uh, and we use about three quarters of a billion here in Northern Ireland, and the rest uh, goes uh, uh, across the water and, and our, our down south. And you're talking that. Um, we may be 1.9 million people, but we feed 10 million on the amount of food uh, and drink that we, we, we produce here. Um, actually, um, you know, the, the, we're very fleet of fit in, in the retail industry of being able to change our supply chains each uh, as and when we, we needed to. And we did that at the start of this crisis when there were slight problems and uh, we were able to, 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 to weather those. One of the good things is that we are in the Northern Ireland uh, growing and producing season and we are seeing that Northern Ireland uh, both farm quality assured produce 
as as well as our our, our vegetables and, and and other items are are flying off the shelf. So you can rest assured that we're we're definitely uh, doing our best. Um, on the challenges of online, yes, um, we in Northern Ireland were particularly uh, slow, shall we say, at the, 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 the online revolution. Uh, but then December 2012, January 13th, you know, it seemed like everybody uh, and their dog got a, a tablet and started buying uh, online. Now, you're absolutely right. Not only does it stop browsing, but it cuts down on things like impulse buying. And, you know, the, there has been a lot of, uh, of, of change. So we, we need to sort of embrace that change. And that means that we need to work uh, a, a wee bit harder. And we need to make our high streets destinations. Um, and this is something that Glenn and I um, are of one voice on. It's about how to make um, our high streets accessible, how to make them safe, uh, how to look at simple things like car parking um, that really do make a difference. But the big thing is that retail is going to contract. It's happened in, uh, all across the world and it will continue to happen here. What we need to do is to make sure that for our, our high streets to be uh, a, 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 a destination, it's about getting people to spend their time, not just spending their, their money. And that means that there needs to be a mix of hospitality, a mix of, of leisure, uh, and, and to get people to spend a lot of time and not just uh, to pop in for their messages, as my mommy would say. Great. Gentlemen, thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Gordon. John Adard. Uh, thank you, and thank you both to your, for your presentation. Um, the committee has been receiving significant amounts of evidence over this last several weeks, and, and it's all proved useful, or much of it has proved useful in moving forward. But, Glenn, I have to disagree with you in terms of a, a date-driven uh, agenda in terms of reopening the economy. Uh, the, the premises of the argument don't stack up, and indeed, when you examine those economies that have given dates, such as the South or indeed England, they're heavily caveated on the basis that they will open if the infection rate is uh, continuing to reduce or stay at a certain level. So this idea that you put out a date and that will be when a business open is actually a false argument. It doesn't stack up, and I think it raises expectations um, both in terms of the business sector and also in terms of your consumers that something is going to happen. But what if that doesn't happen? And, and, and John Stewart mentioned earlier on around, for instance, the clothing sector. And he made a valid point in terms of moving from one season to another. It says he, he knows nothing about clothing. <laughs> but uh, if, for instance, say for, say for instance, uh, you, some of your, your businesses believe that they were opening in June and bought in a considerable amount of stock for the next season, and the R rate, the infection rate goes up and they don't open, they're facing a significant loss. So I think we need to move forward uh, on evidence base uh, and ensure that we open safely. Because I, I do believe that if we have go into another major lockdown, many businesses simply will not recover from that. So let's ensure whatever we do is evidence based. We open our economy, and that economy opens, and I, it will open in a new era, and, and some of it has been touched on already. Uh, and I around the e-commerce, which was already hitting the, the high street significantly. Uh, and one of the features that agriculture had, the or one of the words that entered uh, agricultural, the dialect was diversification. And I think that's where, where our high streets and, and, our, and our businesses are going. Um, consumer habits will have changed as a result of this. Business habits will have changed as a result of this. I see businesses in my own area, small uh, butchers, bakers, whatever me doing deliveries, mm. something they would never have imagined they would ever, ever do, uh, and now they're doing it. One of the businesses actually is now opening only two days a week because they're that busy doing deliveries. So I, I think that's where the conversation needs to go in terms of mm. how we open our businesses, uh, what those businesses will look like in the future, and how the executive and government supports them businesses to diversify as a result of the changes that have happened to consumer uh, practices. Well, John, I can come back. Thanks for those points. Mm. What I would say is that, you know, as we've said this, and both of us have said this, that any of this needs to be predicated on the science, on the medical advice. Uh, all of this has to be predicated on that. And, you know, we're, we're, again, we repeat that uh, because we want to ensure that, that uh, the shoppers and shop staff are, are safe in, in all of this. So we're, we're not in any way displaying uh, the science message. 
I think it's important that wh why we can begin that some of that preparation for town centres, we can start to get what that might look like. Um, we can start that ball rolling, certainly. But, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the, the plan for England, if you look at the plan for the Republic, there is indicative timings in there. And I think that, yeah, we absolutely, none of this is easy. None of this is, is going to be simple in terms of reopening the economy. But, you know, if we don't begin serious preparations, then we're going to have, I mean, for instance, poverty is going to be as much a killer as this uh, virus if we don't reopen our economy. We already had going into this crisis a mental health epidemic. Goodness knows what it's going to be like after we lift the lockdown. You know, if our economy falls off the cliff, and there are no jobs there, then I think that, that poverty is going to be as much a public health risk uh, as the virus in many respects. So we've got to ensure that we reopen our economy in a safe way, which is predicated on medical advice. Um, but in all, uh, so we, do, we do need that strategy. We need to begin the plans to reopen our economy in a safe, uh, sound manner. Just, just, and maybe this is something the, the committee may want to take up. Just, I, I would have hoped that the, the forum that Aidan's involved in is actually looking at those issues: how we open the economy, uh, and, and in terms of you have already made a number, and I've heard this from other groups as well. You know, there's there's different roles on the street. Who who, who marshals the people on the street as they're queuing up to go into shops? Uh, the, the sanitizers, the cleansing, all those sorts of things need to be looked at. I would hope. At the forum that Aidan's involved in, and I don't know if he can breach the confidence or if it is a confidence issue even, uh, is involved in that sort of work already. So there isn't a, a case of where we're in a hiatus where nothing's being discussed. We are discussing how to open the economy and, and the plan that was published yesterday reveals that. And then we, we, we implement those plans as each stage of the economy opens up again. I don't know if Aidan wants to make any comment on that. So we are we, we are looking at at uh, that. It's remiss of me to I, I I couldn't say exactly until it's it's all signed off. But there, there's a lot of stuff that's going through at the minute. So um, at date, each stage of this crisis since the forum has been uh, founded, we have looked at different areas that need to be worked on. So for example, the priority left and then uh, the guidance on safety in the workplace with regard to, to COVID nineteen and this. The, the forum is continued to, to, to work on, on, on and advise the executive on those things. I think um, where time frames would be useful, even if we had a date as to this is when we will make another decision or this is when we will look at it again, or, you know, it's, I think it, this is where the friction is, is John, between the need to plan and the, and the fact that there, it'll take three, four, five weeks for some reason there's to be up and running. Um, with the need to be reactive uh, and not, as you say, build up uh, false hope or, or false expectation, and there's always there's always going to be a friction there. I think the 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 big thing to take away from this is, you know, while business does like certainty, I think both Glenn and I are united in the fact that our biggest priority is going to be the people who work with us. Uh, and you know, everyone was saying there how how how, how great the retail staff is. We we. Glenn and I have been getting a bit of praise out of this uh, over this past few weeks, and we're very quick to point out that all we do is talk. Uh, the people who are actually uh, doing the good job is, is the, the delivery drivers and those people stacking shelves and those people uh, on the tills, and they'll remain our, our first priority. Three week cycles of review that the executive is doing in relation to the, the restrictions. Um, and obviously, the, the first ministers have said that they will try and give as much notice as possible, and that obviously that will be um, reviewed on a on daily basis in terms of, of the R number um, to re re reduce the measures that are in place if that can be done more rapidly as well. Um, and I, I think we all recognise that there is a desire for. Um, the more certainty around the dates, but you know, if you look at some of the examples in other countries like Germany that have actually had to take a step back because mm -hmm. reopening um, increased the spread of the virus, I think the approach that we, we are adopting is a sensible one. Um, Sinead? Hello, Aidan and Glenn, how are you? Hi. Hello. 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 Hello.
Um, I, I suppose, I mean, I have been involved uh, with both of these in relation to uh, town centre strategy and, and plans uh, and that. Um, and obviously, I think that we have to future-proof our town centres now. Um, we we had to before this, and I think now this is kind of um, uh, more urgent than ever. And it would be good if we had a replicate kind of programme like the town centre fund that has been rolled out in England. Um, because I think it has to be a collaborative approach between our uh, local authorities and the executives to see uh, what what we what what measures we can put in place in our town centres in order to give people the confidence to go back in again. Because I think this is about a confidence building uh, exercise more than anything else now at this stage. Um, but one of the things that I would like to ask Aidan, uh, you know, I think there has to be a blended approach to to all of this, and I'm really delighted to see um, the local businesses and how they have stepped up um, and convenience stores and I hope that you know people remember that and appreciate that um, after other shops open and, and continue to use their local stores uh, but one of the things that has happened as well you know a lot of, of our stores have gone online um, uh, even if they're only serving the local um, the, the, the local customers but that is something that I think we could improve on uh, and work on uh, and develop as well, because we, we will have to kind of um, have the, the bricks and mortar, but also the, the, the class as well. So, um, but I'm concerned about Aidan saying that 13.5% of the online businesses have closed. What, what is that about? What does he mean by that? Mm -hmm. uh, let me just bring that up. Uh, so we did a survey of our members and in the non-food retailers, 59% um, said that they were uh, significantly impacted uh, their ability to trade. Of those closed doors, only 48% uh, were trading online as normal. 30, 13.5% closed their online offering uh, and 32.7% are trading online in a limited capacity. Um, so, yeah, the, the big thing there was the fact that um, some felt that they couldn't keep their warehouses and distribution centres open, uh, some felt that they couldn't keep their necessary, uh, put the necessary safety measures in, in place, others thought that they didn't have uh, the critical mass needed to keep uh, in, in, a, in a profit. So, it's not just the case that you have to open one part of a warehouse, you have to open all of the warehouse and have all of the warehouse staff and have all of the delivery uh, points. So um, it, 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 it either wasn't profitable or they couldn't have it safe. So um, yeah, so, so we, we've seen even some of the, the big names who, uh, who who haven't been able to, to open during this period either because it wasn't, uh, they didn't feel that it was safe in, in line with government guidance or they didn't feel that it, 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 they could operate at, uh, at a profit and would be uh, severely losing uh, money. Um, if you look at some of the factors that are affected, clothing and footwear in March, now this is when they were, a lot of them were proceeding at the start of March, um, but they were 50% down, furniture down 30%. Um, now that is got a lot worse uh, since then. On the other side of things, we are seeing uh, small uh, retailers who have never had an online presence going online. And we're also seeing um, people who have never shopped online, including my parents in their 70s in Portadown, who have, have uh, made their first online purchases. Um, so, you know, th this is um, presents an opportunity uh, in, in the medium term for smaller uh, businesses to get involved with that online and, and people maybe to do their browsing online as well. But it also presents that challenge of getting people back the high street and why um, we need to really hone in on uh, the high street being a destination and going there being a really good experience. Absolutely agree. Uh, the other issue that you have been working on again is logistics and keeping the supply chains going and the difficulties that we've experienced with that. Um, uh, do you see or do you think that we have um, been able to address some of those problems within, within the executive? Or are, do you see that there's still some problems in the in the logistics going forward? And just uh, I know Brexit is coming, or the the EU transition is going to, to to come to a close in December. Will will that have an impact as well within the retail um, sector? So um, we uh, yeah, logistics has been a a, a big thing, and, and for the first sort of. Um, 
couple of weeks, whenever we saw that panic buying, there was pressure on supply chains, not because of COVID, but because of people overbuying when they didn't have to. Um, one of the things that this has, has proven is that just-in-time supply chains are amazing because they keep costs down and they also make sure that we have food on our shelves when we need it. But what it's also proven is that slight problems can become big problems very, very quickly. And to be honest, the first sort of three or four weeks of this, the majority of my time was spent firefighting on supply chain issues. Um, and that was things coming from EU, things coming from Great Britain, uh, things even traveling north and south. So there, there, was, there was a lot going on there. Um, and logistics um, are, are, are lifebloods. Um, we account for uh, 70% of all the value of everything that comes across the Irish Sea is for retailers and retail, retail shelves. Um, Brexit is coming. Um, or, or the end of the transition period. Um, I give evidence uh, to the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee uh, last week, a couple of weeks before that, it was the House of Lords Committee who was giving evidence to, uh, and I'm currently finishing a paper to uh, the uh, EU Future Relationship Committee. So it's, it's definitely uh, smack bang in the middle of our uh, thought process at the moment. Um, one of the things that this has done has brought it into stark focus that if we do not get those mitigations, if we do not get uh, those derogations from the Union Customs Code, and if we do not get some uh, common sense decisions from the Joint Committee, then we are going to be in trouble because we are reliant on our supply chains moving. And it's not just for retail, it's for those who manufacture food, those who manufacture goods to send outside of Northern Ireland so that retailers can get the, the lorries coming back. It's a really, really complex thing. And the thing we have to remember about this is in the late 70s, early 80s, about 30% of people's wages was spent on groceries. Now it's about 10%. And what that extra 20% in people's pockets has done is to be able to give them a better, uh, more disposable income and a better standard of, of life. And we definitely don't want to go backwards. And so the, the, uh, the, the thing I'll say is it's the same as I've been saying for the past three years. Um, it's not an either or. Uh, we need unfettered access to the GB and we need unfettered access to the EU. That's what our economy is built on. Thank you, Aidan. Yeah. Brexit hasn't gone away. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I absolutely endorse what Aidan was saying. It's one of the things that I, I think one of the positives that has come out of this crisis, and there are very, very few, let me say, is uh, almost sort of the weekly uh, conference call WebEx that that Aidan and I do with the agri-food sector. And I know we've always been talking to the agri-food sector, and many of those are members of retail and I. But I think it's good that we've got the basis of a proper supply chain forum that has now almost come about by accident. So it's important, um, whilst that's good and work, and we need to ensure that type of sort of structured engagement is there during peacetime as well, to make sure that our supply chain works in every single part of it, uh, you know, from processors, producers, retailers, manufacturers, and I think that that's, that's a very positive dialogue that we've been having. Obviously, a lot of it's predicated around solving problems, but you know, maybe when we move out of this, that we can sort of start to embed that, those good working relationships in a structured way to make sure that our supply chain works for Northern Ireland PLC. Thank you very much, Aidan and Glenn. Thank you. Thanks. Gary? Yeah, thanks, Chair, and thanks to Glenn and, and Aidan for their uh, presentations. Very, very useful. Um, obviously, uh, we all commend the fact that uh, many of our retail businesses, all of them actually, you know, the speed in which they've managed to adopt and, and also to the employees who are obviously on the front line on a, on a daily basis. And the fact that in some of our local stores, the, the amazing work that they're doing to um, support the elderly and the vulnerable and the deliveries and, and all of that work, it has to be commended. Um, Glenn touched there on, on the reopening strategy for town centres. I think there is an opportunity that I've had some local conversations with businesses around this about how, you, um, despite what has happened and the crisis that we currently find ourselves in, we need to look at uh, is now the time, uh, and believe it is the time, to make sure that as we do seek to reopen, that we can um, manage that in a way that we can do things differently for our town centres. Uh, looking at um, the, you know, the opening of pavements, for example, pedestrian areas, how, how do we uh, do that in a way that we can uh, manage social distancing? Um, and of course, that's going to require the departments, the councils, and yourselves all to be working together 
collectively to make that happen. I just want to touch the fact that in terms of this this strategy and this plan, we've seen in the past where sometimes uh, you know a one size fits all doesn't work. And I know that within my own constituency here in Londonderry, there are plans uh, being put together to look at uh, how the town centre will open as we go through the next few phases. But I just to get your thoughts in terms of you know, how do we ensure that we can do this in a way that that really now uh, these new life and new energy into our city centres or town centres? Well, I, I think that um, a lot of the ideas we've been forward, putting forward in terms of a town centre reopening strategy is based upon the High Street uh, Task Force, which is set up by the UK government. So I think they have published a very, very good paper. I'm very happy to supply that to, uh, to, to, your, to your clerk, Peter, uh, about how they envisage that it can be done. And I think if you look at the example, like for instance, uh, in Belfast City Centre, uh, some of the big business improvement districts already have stewards helping and advising people uh, where to go and assisting people. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the model is there, and that's why I think further support to bid during this crisis is important because I think they have a key role in a, with a, in a reopening uh, strategy. But, you know, as I said, uh, let, let's start the preparation on that. Now. Let's start. You know, we also have a, uh, you know, good work being done by a, a tourism recovery group. You know, let's set up a, a, a town city centre recovery group and let's start the ball rolling in terms of, you know, getting these things right. And then when the science left is open, you know, we can hit the ground running in, in all of this. You know, as I said, I have non food retailers that are busting, are busting to reopen. Um, they're keen to get started again. They're keen to, to get there, as are their employees as well. Many of them have been furloughed as well. So, you know, there's an, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a uh, I feel like an enthusiasm there. Um, which, under the current circumstances, uh, it, it's good to see. But, you know, it will require, I think, in particular, a, a partnership approach between the executive uh, and our councils, as well as retail and hospitality as well. But there's no reason why, as I said, we can't start the ball rolling on the preparation for that now. I think as far as... Uh well, like I, I agree with what Glenn said. Um, I think you know we, we need to look at town centres fund, which bids and others with good ideas can access. Uh, it would be good to create a ministerial advisory group for high street, um, and you know, uh, but it, it's important that we, um, you know, we're part of the, uh, the business ecosystem here and an important part. But there's a chance that if we do this correctly, and um, we can bring other sectors with us. And, and vice versa. So um, we need to review the industrial strategy and have a retail strategy as a part of it. But then we can support tourism by promoting Northern Ireland as a tourist destination. Um, we also have, can be, play a part in promoting Northern Ireland agri food across the UK and, and, and further afield. Um, and then one thing that we're going to have to look at, I think, um, we need to commission a study on how Northern Ireland, in the short, medium and longer term, can build up economic resilience, um, learning lessons from the, the COVID-19 uh, situation. Um, we have had, uh, you know, we had the recession in, in uh, 10, 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago, and it took us a long time to recover from that. Um, we do have cycles of boom and bust, and this came out of the blue. Um, but if we had that sort of strategic thinking on what way we wanted the Northern Ireland economy to look, you know, what are the industries that we want to build going forward and what we can do to increase our resilience. I think having those conversations coming out of the back of this um, will be hugely useful in making sure that we can respond to any future crisis in an appropriate and timely manner. Yeah, and I think that what we need as well, just to add to that, is, is a, an intensive reconstruction Says after you know that, that gets our economy back and I think an intensive uh, reconstruction process that includes a stimulus package which you know which mm. fires up the economy again. I, I mean, in terms, of, and maybe if I can give a shout out to uh, the Trade and I Group, which we're part of, which published its own ten-year plan, uh, Vision 2030. There's lots of ideas about you know how we can make Northern Ireland an ecosystem of innovation, create 65,000 new jobs. So I think a lot of, even though that report was published before the crisis, a lot of the ideas, more important than other solutions in there, I, I think could be applicable to moving our economy forward post-COVID-19. Mm. Thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks uh, uh, for, for those comments. I think they were very useful. I think, Chair, that 
obviously we will discuss a little bit later, but I think it is important that those, uh, well, the first of all, that the information comes forward to the fire safe from the UK government, that's fine. But I also think we need to look at those, uh, those groups uh, that he refers to, possibly looking at a ministerial group around high streets or look how that would meet up. But I think it's something maybe we could put to the minister and get her views on. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gareth. Claire? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, hi, Glenn Aidan, uh, Claire Sugden. Um, I, I, Glenn, I really agree with your um, call to extend the business rate holidays from three to 12 months, and I understand Minister uh, Murphy is looking at uh, a tailored scheme, so it'll be interesting to see what comes of that. Um, also agree um, with your comments around there being gaps within the five-step plan, uh, the Northern Ireland Executive Plan. Uh, to be honest, there probably was always going to be gaps, but I do think you raise an important point, particularly um, in relation to things that are not there. And, and child care is one that I'm hearing a lot from my constituents, and it, it's something that we need to have a focus on. The, the other area that I, I think there are gaps is almost the health uh, care provision and vulnerable groups. Um, who, you know, what, what's going to happen to them? Will, will they go back onto statutory sick pay or any sort of um, industrial sick pay? And what about shielding groups? Um, I think that shielding period um, is coming to an end now at the beginning of June. Will that be extended as we emerge? Because if anything, those groups are going to be the most vulnerable whenever things start opening up again. Um, I, I agree entirely with your comments around a town centre reopening strategy. You know, long before this uh, crisis, um, I always maintained that to, to stimulate high streets, we need to be providing something on the high street that you cannot buy more cheaply, more conveniently online, or at least the hybrids that um, uh, physical uh, high street shops are, are offering an online park. And indeed, um, I, I have a number of uh, constituents in, in Corian in particular who are doing their best ever online sales because they already had those skills before this crisis came about and they're able to almost uh, prioritise their, their online product. But then they're also providing a great independent business on the high street, which very much adds to, to the entire product. Um, for me, going into the high street is almost a social thing rather than a retail um, experience. And, you know, I, I think we see that with the emergence of so many coffee shops. And it is interesting that it's those types of businesses that will be the last in the five-step plan to open again. So I think we have to be mindful of that, that, you know, whilst we need to have a town centre recovery plan, when you feed in the five-step Northern Ireland executive um, approach, it will be coffee shops and cafes that will be the last to open. Are people going to go into the town centre if they're not going to have that accessibility? Maybe that was the reason they were going in for in the first place. Um, uh, to pick up on other points that, uh, or points that other members have made in and around the online support, we, we had a briefing from Enterprise NI um, uh, just before yourselves, and they were talking about how they can almost repurpose other programmes that, that, that their businesses would use um, in light of the COVID-19 crisis. And I think if, if there's an opportunity, there certainly is in terms of encourage pe encouraging people to go online. We've seen it nearly happen too quickly um, um, in the sense that they're, they're doing what they can. But you know, to fully utilise and maximise whatever the future will look like, I, I do think that we need to be supporting a small, particularly independent businesses, to, to, to provide an online product and, and you know, sort of supplement what they're offering to us on the high street. So I, I suppose I'm just really reiterating a lot of what you have said. Um, and, and I do think moving forward, um, it will have to be that hybrid. Um, you know, I really like that idea of you know, a, a high street ecosystem, a, a high street for the 21st century. Um, because I think that was already the conversation that needed to be happening long before COVID. This is almost stimulated that conversation. Uh, uh, and you know what I, I find as well, um, a, a point is that people who wouldn't previously have online shops have had to online shop, and they might find that that's a better way of accessing product. So they may not go back to the high street as they would previously because they find that actually it's much more convenient for them in their lives. You know, um, certainly as someone who works, you know, throughout the day, I find it really difficult to shop on the high street because shops are usually closed before I can get there. You know, so we need to have a conversation too about opening times. You know, maybe we should be opening later and staying opening, or so opening later in the mornings and staying up or opening later in the evenings. I, I, I think this is a really um, exciting opportunity to take out of this crisis. Um, and you know, I certainly look forward to people like yourselves and, and councils too play, play a big uh, a big role in all of this. Um, you know, I think they need to be part of the conversation. Thank you.
Well, I mean, I think that in, in one sense, uh, another crisis, the, the pre mark fire crisis in Belfast, uh, one of the, the few positives come out of that was a wider debate about what type of town and city centres and high streets we want to see. And I think it was very, very clear that, you know, with some of the points that general public were saying, that town centres, high streets need to be fun, family friendly, uh, yeah. accessible, offer choice and be uh, destinations. And it's about putting the social... Uh, in the shopping, and there's no reason why we can't get back to that, or at least have a strategy to uh, address that. And you, know, one of the things that you, I mean, you touched on rates. Uh, I mean, we highlighted before this crisis that there are broken, antiquated uh, system of business rates. It's not fit for purpose. It was a huge drag in the economy, and this has been proved all the more during this crisis. You know that Northern Ireland businesses were paying the highest by a long way business rates. Um, and that's why it's so important, uh, at least in the short term, to get uh, great rate to those businesses that need the most. But longer term, we shouldn't lose sight of the consultation that the uh, Department of Finance initiated before the crisis and have you know, a completely restructured, reformed system of business rates, which is fit for purpose, that will allow our town centres and our retail sector and our hospitality sector to grow. I think that one of the, obviously, the ongoing problem in all of this is obviously hospitality is going to be last in the queue of reopening. And that mm-hmm. does pose significant problems for uh, obviously our town and city centres because, you know, we can't do town and city centres essentially without the hospitality being there. Yeah. Um, so it, it's absolutely, I think, and you're obviously working very closely with our, our colleagues in Hospitality Ulster uh, about all of those. Uh, challenges that, that that their sector faces, but you know that's why I think let's start the ball rolling on this town centre reopening strategy, um, because eventually what that will do is, is remove potentially some of the the challenges that prevent hospitality from opening. You know, maybe in the medium term future, um, if we can get a lot of that prep done now, uh, you know, making how we have a proper stewarding strategy in in town centres, proper hygiene, sanitising maybe retrofitting some of what way our town centres and high streets operate to make sure that we can facilitate the safe uh, reopening for, uh, for, for... Because, you know, our strategy is not just for shops. It has to be for shopping and shoppers, you know. We just can't structure something around that is good for shops, but, you know, it's is not good for shoppers and, indeed, our staff as well. Yeah, no, I, I entirely agree, particularly around the, the reform of the rating system. And another point, um, I want when we talk about online systems, uh, uh, Aidan said earlier that the impulse buy is gone, you know, certainly with Insta business. I, I, I don't think it is. If anything, I find myself making quite a number of impulse buys, um, <laughs> but certainly coming from social media. And, you know, so I, I think an awful lot of the time when we think of online sales, we think of online uh, shops via a website. Whereas now, I, I think a lot of people are selling via social media, and it's a very new type of phenomenon, but it's super easy. And, um, well, certainly for the consumer, it's super easy, and I think that's the point. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's those skills that we need to start encouraging among people. You know, like, I, I buy with my eyes all the time, and I'm sure many customers do. And, you know, if it, it's about presentation, it's about marketing um, online, it's about influencers. Um, and, and I think we have to be cognizant of all of that if we are going to you know, to try and uh, upskill our businesses to, to have an online uh, presence. It's not just about going to a website and buying something. It's about, uh, I suppose, tempting your, your consumers by the wonderful things they see on Instagram and, and other social media sites. Okay. Um, thank you both very much for your presentations. They were really useful to us, and I'm sure we'll be back in touch with you again soon. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, members, we'll move on quickly to our next briefing. Chair, before we bring in the next briefing, would it be possible to get uh, a presentation from the forum, the executives forum, on whether it's an official or something can come in and tell us exactly what work that forum's doing? We've got, um, Chair, we've got the LRA in next week and they're going to yeah. reflect on the forum. Yeah. Um, I'll have a word with Tom Evans and see how, how much detail he can go into, because it, uh, essentially it's got a lot of membership on it. But I had a, a brief discussion with him on the phone yesterday, and I'm hoping he'll give more insight into how that works 
and what exactly the sort of purpose is. Certainly, the, the conversation um, reflected that it was a very useful forum. I'll have a word with him and see if that's um, something he'll be able to do as part of that presentation, because I think they're going to focus on, on just how the forum has worked. That will be useful. And we can sort of see where we go from there. I, it's one of those, I don't think there's a... There's not like a face of the forum, if you know what I mean. Mm. The LRA is as close as it comes in that they chair it. So I'll have a word with Tom and see how that... Uh, and their communication strategy with business. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. that in particular. It's, it's, that it's under the that, department, that's isn't That's the it? issue, I think, maybe, is that it doesn't have that structure. Um, and and there may, that, that might be the thing. It's trying to find out whether or not there is actually a secretariat. Like I said, there's no secretariat. But it's unlikely there's going to be a communication strategy and things are being you know pushed on a particular way. But I, I talked to Tom okay. about... How we get to the bottom of that, because, that might be useful. Uh, certainly all of the reflections on it that we've heard is that it's very useful. Yeah. Um, and it is really important that there is that kind of social dialogue happening yeah. with the wider business yeah. sector and unions and everybody else yeah. who are involved in it. But the output is also yeah. important. And we keep hearing about the useful um, really guidance know. that yeah. there, there is. Um, but we also hear about how businesses need guidance, so you know, yeah, just joining those things up yeah. is going to be important. Um, so our next briefing. Um, on page five. Um, is from um, the Leisure and Entertainment Forum and Lafayette Photography, Irish Legal and Academic on the impact of COVID-19. Um, members will find a clerk's memo at page 33 of your pack, NI Leisure and Entertainment Briefing at page 36, and Lafayette Written Submission at page 40. Um, there are also a couple of news articles there on page 45 and 47. Um, so I'd like to welcome to the meeting Thomas Fagan, Chief Executive of NI Leisure and Tourism Entertainment Forum, um, and Stephen Holland, Managing Director of Lafayette Photography and Irish Legal Academic. And apologies to you both for the, the, the delay this morning. Um, and if you would like to make an, an opening statement, and then members will um, have the opportunity to ask questions. Brief. Briefly, ask questions. <laughs> um, good afternoon. Just ho I hope everyone can hear me. Yep. Yes, mm -hmm. um, Thank you, Chair, and thank you to all the members of the committee for agreeing to give us time. So just by introduction, my name is Thomas Fagan, um, and I have set up the Leisure, Northern Ireland Leisure and Entertainment Forum um, really to give a collective voice to that industry during this critical period. Um, so in terms of membership, um, just to put into context, our members today um, probably are sitting in the region of 60 plus in terms of businesses. Um, there are a lot of household names on the membership, so it, I'll not name them all, but to name a few, just to put it into context, you know, we're talking about We Are Vertigo, Artastic, Clip and Climb, um, Funky Monkeys, Jeff Center, Omniplex Cinemas, Movie House Cinemas, um, and the list goes on and on. Um, we're talking to uh, amusement groups across the length and breadth of Northern Ireland. Um, and our plight is pretty desperate, if I'm honest. Um, our industry has been severely hit by this crisis. A lot of this you will already know, but thank you for the opportunity to, to present it. Um, we were forced to close, the industry was forced to close on the 20th of March, and um, that leaves us in a position where we have zero turnover. Um, we've got no customers, we've got no opportunity to reopen for any time soon. So we're first closed, we'll be last to reopen. And just listening to your previous presentation with regards to and um, retail and the dimension of hospitality, we're in the same position. Um, but in, in a lot of our cases, it's, it's actually worse um, because the nature of our business is that we're space hungry. Our buildings are big and our businesses are typically relatively small. And what that means in terms of assistance is we cannot get access to uh, the COVID grant scheme, the £25,000 cash grant. Uh, we can't generate any revenue and um, we will have a lot of costs in terms of becoming operational again. Um, there was some uh, light relief when the announcement was made for rates relief for 12 months because obviously as space-hungry businesses, that, that is a relief that would be important to us. 
um, and then obviously that was reduced to three months. So, I mean, our our um, our objectives are very simple. Um, we need access to some form of assistance in terms of cash grants or or otherwise. Um, we need the rates release to be extended. Um, and I am speaking on behalf of all of our members. We are in the same position. Like probably about ninety percent of our members are in this position. Virtually all of us have fallen through the cracks. Um, in terms of social distancing, whenever we do get to reopen, which is still to be declared a date, um, we're not going to have the same capacity. We're not going to have the same demand. And in a lot of cases, um, we're, if our capacity is, is as low as we think it might be, um, we won't be in a profitable position. We'll be in a break. We'll be in a a loss-making position, which for any business is not sustainable. Um, so in terms of, we haven't been, you know, I'm sure nobody thinks this, but you know, the majority of our employees are furloughed, but I can rest assured in terms of the businesses themselves, um, you know, there's a lot of work that we're, we're trying to be heard in terms of um, what how desperate our plight is. So, you know, today we've already, We've reached out to the tourism working group. We've spoke to the University of Ulster in terms of the, the rates review panel that's been set up. We've had a meeting with the finance minister. We're obviously um, very thankful for the meeting with yourselves today. And we've reached out to Invest NI. Um, so in terms of the picture, it's pretty bleak in terms of leisure and entertainment in Northern Ireland. And probably the final point that I would make on that would be I'm a father of two. Um, my wife works in the NHS, and whenever we do get out of this pandemic, or whenever social distancing is, is loosened, we are the very industry that people are going to look and need to go to in terms of their health and mental well-being. Um, and that also goes along with um, allowing Northern Ireland to recover as a tourism destination. A lot of people are going to stay at home. We are the very reason why people will have things to do, but we need to survive. Um, so that's really my presentation. That's what I ha have to say. Um, I'm, I'm really thankful of the opportunity to speak. I'm looking forward to um, talking to you in more detail. Thank you. Stephen, 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 are you there? Uh, yes. Yeah. You want to go ahead? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so I'd echo what Thomas was saying there, and thank you for the opportunity to put our sector on the agenda as well. Um, so we decided to make our, our submission as we became increasingly aware of references to concerts and sporting events as an umbrella phrase, if you like, to cover events. Um, in the context of COVID-19. And I suppose what we want to do is emphasize that only a tiny proportion of the events approach anything of that scale. Um, so we feel it's more realistic if we can have a, a tiered resumption ultimately of events. Um, we hope the information we provide us um, demonstrates that it's a low risk nature of work involved in the planning of events specifically and that the majority of staff and customers of event days fall into low risk groups. Um, so in our evaluation, I suppose I would like to emphasize same as retail and I did that we are acutely aware of the need to ensure we don't do anything which might contribute to any reinstatement of restrictions at a later date. We want it to be safe when we do resume. Um, we had a look at um, the different categories of events and essentially 82% of the smaller events that take place could be allowed to resume under the first two phases of what we pr proposed as a resumption. Um, and then we had a look at uh, sample venues from around Nor Northern Ireland and of 27 we sampled, 23 could re reopen within the first two phases, assuming viability. Um, this would help a good proportion of those dependent on the most common types of events and allow venues that we have considered to still provide social distancing between members of the public. As a rule of thumb, we've assessed that the social distancing could be maintained within venues at approximately 50% of capacity. 
What we can't assess, however, is the degree to which venues can remain viable at 50% capacity, um, which is, of course, a challenge. And it's most likely that some financial supports would be needed to be continued rather than a, an immediate cessation on return to trade. So I suppose while it will be a strain financially and logistically on all types of businesses to reopen safely and reinvent how we work, we must begin to do that sooner rather than later. Um, undoubtedly, the best way for the events industry to begin to roll out new ways of working is to begin with smaller gatherings, and that could act as a dress rehearsal for larger events, helping to perfect the approaches taken and allow staff and the public to be come familiar with and reassured by the steps that are taken. Um, in addition to managing the venue capacity, a degree of overstaffing would also be required to manage elements of the events, such as enforcing hand hygiene, traffic flow and so on. These are increased costs for events operators, but our emphasis at the moment is not on maintaining previous levels of profitability, but just on survival and maintaining our teams intact. So we have tried to, in the first instance, assess all the elements of events that we encounter in the context of the anticipated public health guidelines. And having done so, we've considered if the steps taken would give confidence to staff and customers alike to return. And we think the best we can do is to enable the return of events in a manner that is safe for the majority. And since the events industry isn't an essential service, that people can elect to attend or not, and that puts the onus on us as service providers to essentially deliver our service in a way that creates confidence for people. So it moves the emphasis to the service providers. Um, secondly, we looked at the economic viability of our own businesses in providing services in the manner we think is possible. And it will undoubtedly be a very difficult period for all concerned. However, it is evident that the current essential and very welcome supports have a limited time frame, and we'll have been for nothing if we don't return to work in the near, relatively near future. We just businesses will not survive indefinitely, even with these unprecedented supports in place. So, while we understand the argument for each phase of the lifting of restrictions to be based on infection rates and hospital capacity. Given that a lead time of at least four to six weeks is likely from it is announced that some events can take place until revenue begins to be generated again, there is an urgency for some guidance around target dates for each phase of return, even if they are deemed to be movable. Um, and I suppose a little more detail on what will and will not be permissible in the event sector. Without clear guidance on timings, I think what we are doing really is we're extending the period that businesses are at risk and in need of support. So in conclusion, given the impact of the lockdown to date, the additional costs likely to be incurred in managing the public health changes that are needed at events and the reduced capacity in venues we estimate in our own business that we'll need to achieve an additional minimum of 8.5% of gross margin to service these increased costs. Venues and event-related businesses and self-employed will inevitably require support to maintain viability until trade begins to return to normal. And if you would like us to be prescriptive on what the nature of those supports might be, we have some proposals on it. And that's my few minutes there. I, I hope that was clear for everybody. Yes, thank you both very much for that and for the, the written briefings that you provided because they are very useful. I think John made the point earlier to one of the, the witnesses that the, those who have come to present to us have come with solutions as well as the issues that they, that they very clearly have. Um, and I, I think that the point is well made about the, the size of the premises compared to the size of the business and I think that's something we, we do need to keep reflecting back to the Minister and the Department in terms of the level of support that is necessary um, for businesses and that the rates obviously were a vehicle to direct support but they aren't a catch-all and they aren't the, the solution for, for all businesses. Um, 
I, I, I would like to hear some of those um, proposals, if, if, um, Stephen, if you, you could maybe expand a wee bit in terms of the, the supports that um, would be necessary um, for the events sector. And the, I guess the points are well made as well around the, the lead-in time, and that is something that, that we will reflect back as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've looked at it in, the, in a, a few tiers, really. So assuming we get back to work on a graded basis to events, if you like, uh, we would encourage the phasing out of the job retention scheme rather than a complete cessation, if that was possible. But ultimately, we think we would need a reduction in employers' national insurance contribution. of We, we estimate about 9.5%. And in addition to that, that may be a reduction in the rate of that by about 4%. And that would help us reclaim some of that margin and get us back closer to a break-even point. And other things that might be helpful would be um, some direction to financial institutions in terms of rescheduling of finance obligations. Some are cooperative and some are less so. Um, and another step that would be very useful would be a role a pressure on the financial institutions to roll out contactless payment through mobile phones as that gives a, a, an increased limit for contactless payments and would be very useful at venues in terms of managing the whole public health guidelines no, that's very useful thank you for that um gordon thanks chair and thanks very much gentlemen thomas good to talk to you again um I take it the, the access to the grant scheme in 15 um, to 51 NAV is, is a key issue for, for yourselves. Uh, it, it, it is, Gordon, um, I, and really to sort of elaborate on the point that I've been making, you know, we, the vast majority of our members fall outside of that 51 yeah. NAV, uh, and in, they fall out of it by some considerable margin, you know, so say, the average of our members is sitting around 130,000 NAV, and mm -hmm. you know, in totality, it ranges from 23,000 right up to about 385,000. So, in a lot of cases, these businesses aren't even close to that level of NAV. So, you know, they're way off the mark in terms of getting any assistance. Then, to look at the other side of that, um, we are a zero turn. We're in a zero turnover position. We've been forced to close as of the 20th of March. I really appreciate why we've been forced to close. We understand that health comes first. And that is both in terms of our customers and, and our members of staff. But it leaves us in the same position where we really need help and we can't get help. Um, and it's because typically because of the size of the footprint of the building. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the scheme originally wasn't didn't include leisure and then we argued it and Others did as well, to be fair, and we got, we got leisure included now. We've, we've raised that point, I think, with, with our minister and so on, that uh, the scheme probably wasn't originally designed for leisure, so it may need to be amended. So we're still obviously keeping the pressure on in relation to that. Uh, the furlough scheme, has it been useful for yourselves in, in relation to staff? It has, definitely. Yeah. Gordon and I don't want to come across as in any way ungrateful for the speed or assistance that's already been put in place. You know, I'll commend everyone for what has been done with certain measures. But that really is just allowing us to hold on, hold on to a team of people to provide the services that we do. But that is allowing for the fact that we have a business to provide the public with a service to go back to. You know, so again I would reiterate what Stephen has just said in terms of I don't want to I don't want all of this to be for nothing. We're committed to making this work, but we do need assistance and help in order to make it work. And then just looking at some of the measures, I mean, I took a, a bit of a, a straw poll in terms of different measures that some of our members are having to make, and they're not unique in some cases, and others they are, but, you know, the perfect screens, the, the temperature monitoring, the, um, you know, in sanitizing cabinets, um, extra staff to control the numbers of people in turn you know, maybe it's maybe a lesser number of people but they need controls and monitors to keep people safe so all of that brings additional cost and we are going to reopen to reduce capacity which means 
you know, we are potentially in the loss making position when we reopen. Um, I would see a very good return as being break even, but unlikely that that would be the case. Um, so there have been, there have been some areas of assistance, but I don't want it to be for nothing either. You know, it needs to be, and all of our members are are saying that. You know, they're they're worried that they have a business to do back to. Okay, I think we all appreciate appreciate the work that your you know your groups do, and you know it involves young people especially. You know, there's a sense of adventure. There's a, the benefits of um, being in group in groups. There's also the, the benefits of uh, outdoor activity. All of those things, which are very positive, and and you work together within our local communities as well. So, I think you you know you do play an important part. And it's important that we we do try and support you, Stephen. Just in relation to events, do you see much uh, activity being able to be recovered the rest of this year if we did get back to business? We're, we are still hopeful, but we're uncertain. Uh, especially, we've had a lot of work, work obviously, cancelled from the summer months, but most of our clients are in a holding pattern and they're waiting to see. And a lot of that hinges on guidance, on dates. If they feel they have a good margin of error beyond a date that's proposed, they probably have the confidence to go ahead with planning. But if they don't feel confident we would anticipate in the next month to six weeks that we will start to get cancellations for the, the rest of the year, essentially. Yeah, which would be obviously unfortunate. And the challenge, I suppose, is, is running events on limited capacity and still having a reasonable return. Uh, that's yes. going to be a major challenge if you're on, running on half capacity, for example. It is. Now, one of the areas we looked at in that was movement within the venue. So of the 27 seven sample venues that I looked at, very often we would have a particular space booked in a venue, but given the lack of use of the venues at the moment, there would be more space available. So we would anticipate um, that we could relocate within the venue from say, in the example of the waterfront from hall two to hall one, for example, or alternatively, where you are in the largest venue, but you might have one event in a day, it could be possible to run two to three events for smaller numbers in a day. So you have your same staff on site, your same setup, but you, you deal with your audience in three tiers instead of one. And we've even gone down to the detail of checking fire regulations and assessing how long it would take to exit people one row at a time from an auditorium and how many staff you would need to do that and so on. So the logistics of it are doable within the venues. A lot of it will come down to the viability for the venue itself. And that would very much fit in, in terms of what Thomas was saying, rates relief for the venues because they are such large spaces. Okay, thanks very much, gentlemen. Thank you, and we'll continue to do what we can to support you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Sinead? Yeah. Hello, Thomas and Stephen. Thank you very much for your presentation. I, I suppose um, you're um, reiterating what um, the previous presenters were saying in relation to, to race. And I think that um, as a committee and as a department, we probably, um, within finance and the assembly and the executive, we need to look at the rebound 2020. You know, our businesses are paying the highest rates out of the whole of the UK, and yet we're adversely affected by some of these. Uh, are disproportionately affected by some of, 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 of the items of crisis within um, the, the COVID-19. So um, I think that that's a big message that is coming out of all the presentations today, um, that we need to look at a way of sustaining um, our businesses going forward, and certainly those businesses that are going to be so adversely affected and are going to be the last to reopen uh, really need to have a, a, a rate holiday way beyond the three months. Uh, and, and I suppose your businesses in particular, they have an AD greater than uh, 51K and are actually falling out of all support. So Thomas and Stephen, what I can say to you in, in relation to that, um, thank you for your presentation. And that's my big takeaway from, from what you're saying today, is that uh, Revalve 2020 is not fit for um, our current uh, financial and economic um, situation that we find ourselves.
yourself and uh, thank you thank you very much and it's good to hear that um, there's some agreement on it i suppose um, one of the things with regards to the grant, just to sort of add to that slightly, which seems completely unjustifiable, and I'm sure that you've heard this all before, um, you know, there's something in the region of about £7 million that's been uh, paid out, this sort of terms of usually, £7 million paid out to supermarkets and off licences, and it's really, really hard for businesses like ours to watch that. And um, there, there are just businesses that are trading. It's not their fault. We don't blame them in any way. They're doing a great job. Um, but from our point of view, for us not to be able to get any assistance, whether it be through the extended rates relief or or the grant scheme, it's just really, really hard to watch, you know. So um so without being I don't want to be too emotive on it, it's just simply it just seems quite unfair in terms of our industry. Yeah, thanks, Jeanette. I don't have anything else to add to that really, I suppose. Um so I'd, I'd leave that with Thomas. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. John? Um, uh, thank you again for your presentations. And it's quite clear that your sectors require financial support. Um, and I note the comments around some of the businesses that are open have received financial support. And I know you're not complaining about that, but it does seem a bit of an irony in that where you are closed and can't trade in any other way and have not yet received financial support. I would hope that the, the £40 million hardship fund that was announced last week, well, the details of that will hopefully be published later this week, and that there is light at the end of the tunnel in some small way for both of you, or both of your sectors in that regard. Can I ask, are you aware of the Executive Forum in terms of assisting businesses, or assisting the economy in returning to an opening phase? And... If you are aware of it, have you had any contact or um, communication from them, or are you able to feed into that group? Because I note that the proposals you have around how your businesses could reopen uh, in a safe manner. So, are you aware of that forum? Uh, yes, um, I'm a, I am aware of it, um, but there has been no contact at this moment in time. And I actually wasn't aware of it. Okay. Uh, well, it's, it's something the committee is going to take a look at uh, next week, and, and certainly I think in terms of, and the chair mentioned this at the start, when organisations are coming forward with proposals, I think it's important that the executive and, and the committee as well uh, engage with those proposals, because at this stage we're aware of the, the problems. What we want to see now is proposals on how we open up our economy in a safe way, and in fairness to both of your organisations, you have brought forward proposals which deserve to be examined at the very least. Yeah, I completely agree. Thank you. We'd be delighted to do anything we can to help get the information across. Yeah, likewise, the Leisure Minister is form would be happy to help. Okay, thank you. I completely concur with those remarks. I think it is really important that we capture the, the information that's been provided to us and that that is taken on board in terms of yeah. um, the, the measures. Sure, that's the thing is, in, in, in the sort of usual world and run of things, you would have had an identifiable secretary, as I said before, for the forum, so I would know I can go to that person, that's where you feed in information, etc. I'm honestly, as I say, beyond talking to, to uh, Chief Executive of LRA, I'm not 100% sure how that even works. So, yeah, there's, there's definitely something we need to do there and find out just how these kinds of things can be fed in, because as members are saying, we're getting incredible, um, you know, surveying proposals. Everybody's coming with solutions, and it's then been able to channel those into an, uh, an arena where they can actually be um, built into a recovery plan. Like that, that's just yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, yeah, we we definitely uh, investigate just how we manage that, how we do that. And as I say, with the LRA up next week, hopefully Tom will be able to expand yeah. on how that might be done. Yeah, no, that would be very useful. Um, so, I, yep, go ahead. I possibly offer one more suggestion? It's possibly already been thought of, but um, one thought that I had in terms of recovery um, and maybe assistance that maybe hasn't already been documented. Um, in terms of Invest NI, um, I believe that they're sitting on a per annum budget of about £300 million. Um, would it not make sense in the current climate for that 
funding to be redirected to assisting Indigenous companies to survive this crisis? We are aware that Invest are looking at their budget and how it could be redirected and that, that is part of the department's planning as well. Um, and we are expecting the department's new work plan um, imminently, aren't yeah, we? Chair, the, the minister's already indicated, um, and this, this will happen across uh, executive departments, that they're looking at where budget can be repurposed. And, and as you say, the, the likes of uh, Invest NI has a a budget that is not necessarily um, pre-committed. You know, there's there's a level of discretionary um, spend throughout a year. So uh, the department is already part of that exercise, looking at how that money can be repurposed. And the minister had indicated previously that you know should be fairly hopeful that that money would be be able to be targeted um, in sectors where it's going to be most useful, and that the model will focus on um, indigenous. It's a funny word to be using in terms of, of business, but you know, local businesses rather than just focusing on those who export, which kind of is the current model. Yeah. Um, thank you both for, for being with us this morning and for your presentations. They've been very helpful. Yes, thank you. Um, Thanks very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on then quickly to our, our rising um, item seven on our agenda. There is. Um, a response from the Permanent Secretary at page 50 of our PACs um, on the committee's request for a status report on the overall function of the department during the COVID-19 um, restrictions. Um, members are, are will um, want to note that. Um, and I think I, I would just like to offer a reflection that um, I, I think we do need the committee's appreciation to the efforts of departmental staff in terms of all of the work that has went on behind the scenes in the, putting the various schemes in, um, in place. And so I think we should note that. You can reflect that, Chair, yeah. Um, is there anything else members want to? No. Agreed, Chair. I think just the ongoing issue about the central focal point that yeah. we're, we're keen on. Uh, yeah, and I raised that again with the Minister on Monday, and she said she would look at that again. Um, I think given the, the number of queries that members are getting and probably all MLAs are getting in relation to the grant schemes, it would be very helpful if there was a, a central point of contact. Great. Thanks, Chair. And yeah, probably once center. the hardship fund launches, that's, that's going to be, be more important complex, as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, then 7.2, um, the departmental response regarding correspondence the committee had received from Rani on the security of supply chain and the annual review of RHI tariffs. Um, and the response reflects that the consultation is now open. Um, members can tend to note that. Great, thank you. Um, 7.3, on page 55, there is a response from the Finance Minister to the committee's request um, for um, an update on the approval in relation to the Graduate Medical School at McGee. And the Finance Minister has um, confirmed he's written to the Health Minister for Health, confirming his agreement to the um, graduate entry medical school places that are needed and that these additional places should be provided and located at the Ulster University campus at McGee. Um, and he has urged colleagues to reach conclusion on that issue by the 31st of May deadline. And we are still waiting on responses from the Health and Economy, Health and Economy Minister in relation to that. Um, uh, can I just come in here? Yes, go ahead, Sinead. Chair, no, I just wanted to say um, this, this obviously has moved out into the executive office now yet for a decision. Am I right in saying that? The, the executive have the... Yes, yes. It's um, Essentially, it's now an executive decision um, in terms of meeting that um, General Medical Council deadline of the end of May. The Finance Minister has indicated his willingness, but obviously the... The budget was uh, both health and economy, um, with economy doing an initial capital investment and health having a, an approximately, I think it was a 30 million a year um, running cost. So that's the confirmation we're still seeking. Both members have, or both ministers have still, those two ministers still have to reply. Okay, so 7.4 then. Um, correspondence from Ulster University following their briefing to the committee. Um, and we are wanting to schedule a further briefing from Ulster University, so our members content to note that until then. We, yes. Yeah, we're great. We juggle them into our forward work programme somewhere. Um, 
Then there is um, a page 50 pack of table papers, um, a response from the department in relation to queries from members on COVID-19. Chair, if I can suggest, because we, we, we do need to vacate the room now so it can be sure. um, disinfected before the next committee. If we uh, lift correspondence and do it via correspondence, um, I know if we skip very quickly then to AOB, I know Mr Dunn wants to make a point. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, just uh, in relation to something you may be interested in, Chair, yourself. The North West 200 has now been cancelled this year, and I, I was contacted with the race director last night. The point I'm just making is that he uh, is in a bit of a dilemma. He's, they have spent about 170000 on the preparation for the races this year. He has to pay back... Uh, Quite a sum of that to various uh, organisers of, of the event um, and uh, those participating in it. So uh, he's in a difficult position. So it would it be possible that we could write a letter to the economy minister and the communities minister as well in relation to that to see what sort of support could be forthcoming for this future of the event uh, in next year? Obviously, the focus has now moved to, to next year. So we're hoping to run it later on uh, in the year, and that's why the announcement was made this week that it was officially cancelled. We're hoping to run it towards perhaps in October, but that's not the case now. So they're left with quite a financial liability, and uh, any support would be appreciated. And I think you, you fully appreciate the impact it has, you know, in relation to tourism and. Um, the support for the local economy. The local economy. Yep. So I think we would uh, be keen to see what could be done to support the event in, in the future. If members are content, then we will write to both ministers seeking information on how that can uh, be done. Um, as Mr Dunn said, it's both economy and the Cal bit of communities as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, so we, we'll take that forward, Chair. And, and if we could just, just... If we just flick back then to um, our forward work programme item Thanks, number 10. Chair. On the agenda, um, there's a draft forward work programme, and um, the members can just note that briefing from the department on city deals have been moved to has been moved to the 10th of June. Are members content to agree the forward work programme? Sure. Wonder would be useful maybe for yourself and, and the clerk to sit down. The three briefings in one session doesn't work. So if if, if you want to just look at it in that context, uh, the broad principles of it, I'm happy to agree with, but. It's just uh, there's just so much information we're trying to get on. It's just difficult. And I think the use information we're getting is very useful and important. And I don't think we want to cut the briefings sh yeah. any shorter because members do have to have the opportunity to ask questions. So we will. We look will look at, at creative that. alternatives potentially yeah. using s silver leaf, starleaf, <laughs> that thing. With whatever video Forward. thing, whatever it is. Yeah, we, we, we are very conscious of that issue and, and we will look at alternatives. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Um so the date and time of next meeting is next Wednesday morning in room thirty. So thank you, members. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.